shapes in London pictures. Jackie Snell's back. Neil Williams back. Hi, yes. Thank you. Um, Jackie Snell. Okay. Um, I think we've got back. Can anyone uh, who isn't speaking turn off the camera, please? Okay. I've, okay. I think we have uh, everybody here. I'll, I'll, I'll check obviously before we reach the the item, but uh, I'll I'll make a start um, now and welcome everyone to the uh, remote meeting of World Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Stuart Kelly and I'm the chair of the committee. This meeting is webcast and a record is retained on the council website. For those people at home who are viewing the webcast, uh, I'd like to inform you that if you look above the meeting, you will see a resources tab. If you select this, the uh, link to the agenda will appear on the right hand side and this will enable you to open the agenda reports as PDF documents and follow the discussion uh, and debate. Uh, my role is to ensure that the committee runs smoothly, having regards to behaviour, uh, procedure and ethics. To explain who are with us online, we have planning officers, a highway engineer and an environmental health officer. They will present the applications and provide any technical advice that may be required. The council solicitor, she will give advice to the committee on procedural and legal matters that may arise. Uh, and there is also a minute taker and of course IT support. The elected members will consider the applications and collectively make the decisions. Voting will be by a roll call. Each application will be introduced by the planning officers. Where there is a qualifying petition of 25 signatures or more, I will invite a representative of the petitioners to address the committee for five minutes. I will then invite the applicants or their agents to address the committee for five minutes. Statutory and local consultees may also address the committee. A ward councillor can also address the committee. Once representations have been made and following any questions of clarification from the committee, the speaker may not participate in any debate that follows within the committee. The application will then be open to debate and discussion by members of the planning committee and we will then make a decision on the application. When making decisions, members may only have regard to material planning considerations. It is a matter for each member individually to balance these considerations and to decide what weight to give them. Members will also have regard to our local planning policies and to the national planning policy framework and guidance. The order of tonight's agenda may be varied. A reminder then for members, keep your microphone muted and your camera off until called to speak. Ensure that the chat function is accessible to you. Indicate that you want to speak by typing your request into the chat, country, uh, into the chat function. Turn on your camera and your microphone prior to speaking. Turn them off again when you're finished. When a vote is to be taken, the solicitor will call your name. We now need to just check that all members are present and their equipment is working correctly. When I call your name, could you turn on your camera, introduce yourself and then your mic uh, and confirm uh, all is working, please. So, if we start now with Bruce Berry. Good evening, Chair. It's Bruce. Uh, Alan Bray. Good evening, Chair. I'm uh, deputising for Councillor Corkhill. Thanks. George Davis. Good evening, Chair. Everything's fine and correct. Thank you. Lovely. Steve Fawkes. Yes, Chair, everything's OK. Samantha Frost. Good evening, Chair. Yeah, everything working OK. Steve Hayes. Good evening, Chair. Everything working OK. Thank you. Kathy Hodgson. Good evening, Chair. All present and correct. Uh, Mary Jordan. Uh, 
everything's correct, everything's fine. Is your camera working, Mary? Uh, I pressed it. I pressed it twice by mistake. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Brian Kelly. Evening, Chair. Everything's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ian Lewis. Ian, Ian Lewis. Thank you, sir. I am present and correct now. Thank you. Uh, Paul Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm here. Um, Stuart Whittingham. Thanks, Chair. I'm here, all working. As far as I'm aware, if you can hear me. Good to see you. And Irene Williams. Dear in chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did you hear me? I can. Thank you. Um, members, there, there is a significant lag between um, you clicking your camera on um, and it picking up your um, your. Uh, uh, and your, your image coming on. The advice that, that, that we have from the solicitor is that, you can, that your image needs to be on the screen when you cast your vote. When we come to vote then, uh, when the solicitor calls your name, um, if, if you don't vote until the solicitor lets you know that your, your image has actually appeared on the, uh, on the screen, so, or, or at least you see your image on the screen. Um, that's, that's probably the best way of getting, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, Councillor Kelly, if I can just um, yes. explain, they will, the uh, member will need to speak in order for their picture to show on the screen. So if when I call their name, if they repeat their name again, right. that will show the, the picture on the, you know, they, they will come up on the screen and then they can cast their vote. Okay. That's that's fine. You'll see that picture on the screen. Okay, let's uh, uh, let's move on then. So um, into the uh, agenda, item one of the minutes of the uh, meeting held on the twenty eighth of uh, April. Um, are we content uh, to um, approve those minutes? I think in the chat function. So we'll take those minutes as uh, approved. Um, Thanks, Stuart. Um, item two uh, is the Members' Code of Conduct, Conduct Declarations of Interest. Members of the committee are asked whether they have any personal or prejudicial interests in connection with any application on the agenda, and if so, to declare them and state the nature of the interest. Steve House. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's uh, agenda item five, the Mel's Railway Station. Uh, I did declare a personal interest at the committee where it wasn't heard. Uh, I have investigated further and I am, uh, uh, as a member of the Transport Committee to the Liverpool City Region, uh, previously known as Mersey Travel, um, I am content that I have no direct uh, influence over the day-to-day -day operations of the applicants. So therefore, I'm expressing a personal interest uh, with the ability to speak and vote on that matter. Uh, on the other uh, issue I did raise during the briefing, when my declaration in interest on an item at the last committee was challenged, uh, I wasn't able to reply to that, uh, and I, I felt slightly aggrieved having watched it on, on video cam. Uh, so um, I'll make, make that opportunity at a, a later uh, date to uh, talk about that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Steve, uh, for clarifying uh, that. Uh, Irene, Irene Williams. Yeah, um, I just want to declare personal interest. Um, my grandchildren will be going to the nursery next door to the application. Okay. Uh, thanks hey, Councillor Williams, can you just confirm which item that is in relation? Oh, sorry, it's item four. Thank you. To apologise. Okay, excellent. Um, we will vary the uh, uh, the agenda. We have um, 
Uh, numbers, of mem- number of members of the public here for item four, uh, Abbeyfield Road, uh, Abbeyfield House, 65 Prenton Road, uh, West, and some more councillors written to address us. So if we take that application first. Um, so before we move into that, can I just check then that the lead petitioner, Mr. Williams, is able to oh, hear Hello, yeah. yeah. Hi. Present and correct. I don't know if you can see the image. Yeah. Not yet, Mr. Williams. There no. you are. There you are. Yeah, there's a significant lag on the image. I'll have to turn the phone off. All right, love. Tra. Um, and for the applicants, I've been advised that there's a, a, a Jackie Snell. Jackie Snell here. Um, Jackie Snell's not attending. I'm the chief exec. I'm just replying in her stead. Thank you very much. Uh, and is the agent also here with you? Or? Hello, yes, Alex Pickard from SDA Architecture Agent is here. Okay, thank you. Um, and Ward Councillors, um, is Council Cook with us online? Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can certainly hear you. Now Good. we can hear you. Yes. Can see me as well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Councillor Norbury, are you here? Can you hear? Hi, Chair. Yeah, uh, I'm here. Yeah, great. Excellent. Okay, so I'll uh, call you all in at the uh, at the appropriate uh, time. Uh, for now, if I ask the um, plan officer to introduce their report, please. Can I just check that the location plan is on screen? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, through you, Chair. So this application um, seeks planning permission for the change of use of a residential care home to 15 self-contained flats. As a residential use in the primarily residential area, the principle of this change of use is considered to be an acceptable reuse of the property. The floor layout of the The floor layout of the property together with the external elevations will remain unaltered and there are no additions proposed. 15 flats will be provided, each containing a bathroom and kitchenette and you should be able to see the, um, the proposed floor plans for each of those on the screen now. Each flat is a single dwelling house occupied by a single person and therefore each flat should be regarded as forming a single household tenants will each pay their own council tax. A defining feature of the planning system is that it should concern itself only with matters of land use and should not have regard to occupancy characteristics. Although the application details the use of these flats as providing emergency short-term provision and mid-term move-on accommodation for homeless people whilst they look to secure permanent long-term accommodation. Wirral Ark, who will run the property, currently operate a number of such sites across the borough as they seek to assist with the ongoing homelessness problem on the Wirral. There is a significant shortage on the borough for mid-term move-on accommodation for people who have found themselves without a home and are unable to find long-term permanent accommodation. Residents will live in their flats independently. It is not a hostel. There will be 24-7 support provided to the residents by support workers who will help the tenants maintain a successful tenancy and to help with repairs, maintenance and in identifying suitable long-term accommodation within the private rented sector or social housing. The proposal will assist in meeting one of the key drivers in Wirral's homelessness and rough sleeping strategy 2020 to 2025 in terms of working with providers to improve move on options. The proposal seeks permission for a residential use within a residential area. Whilst occupancy of housing is not a material planning consideration, nevertheless, the proposals do serve to meet an identified housing need. There will be little material change from the use of the building as a care home, and as it's located within the primarily residential area, the proposals are considered to be acceptable and are recommended for approval. There is a qualifying petition of objection. Okay, thanks for that. Can I invite the... Uh, petitioner Mr Williams to turn on his camera and mic. Hi Chair, thank you. Is, is, 
is the image coming through? It has. Are we, uh, are we going to have, have Mr. Williams on the screen? Okay. You tell me when you want me to go. Okay, yeah, I'll, I will do just a moment. I'm just wondering whether Mr. Williams should be, now be on the screen as opposed to in a little box. Oh, um, I don't know how to control that from this end. I don't think it, I don't think it's here. If Matthew removes the drawing, we don't need to see it throughout. So then we need to speak to the applicant. That's better. That's better. Okay. Um, right. There's a, a qualified petition, um, Mr. Williams. You're the lead petitioner. Um, you have five minutes um, to address us, um, and I'll give you a uh, a nudge when you have uh, one minute. Uh, left, following which okay. there may be some questions and clarification members of the committee may wish to ask. So you have five minutes. Thank you, dear. Uh, well, first of all, hello and good evening. I'm Neil Williams, and along with my wife, Gaynor, we own Buildings Block Day Nursery, which is next door bordering property to this proposal. And I represent the nursery and residents of and surrounding area against the proposal for this project. Homelessness and rough sleeping have no part to play in a modern and civilised society. Those who work hard to eradicate this do so with the full respect, admiration and support of myself and fellow community members. We can and all should be should be able to tackle these problems in our society and we must ensure we provide adequate resources in the right locations with solid support mechanisms which comply with planning requirements. In 2016, the council received an Ofsted rating of inadequate which highlighted significant failures around safeguarding for young children. Since this, they have worked hard to receive a rating of needs improvement in 2019, with a focus on children needing protection and associated safeguarding issues. The issues to which the residents object to the proposal are clearly, clearly, clearly laid out to this committee in emails from myself and Lynn Gallagher on the 11th of the 5th, 2020, which the chair has assured us have been given for a consideration by all committee members. Item one, safeguarding. The nursery enables care provision for children and babies aged zero to five years, some with disabilities, special educational needs, and some looked after children. Despite the nursery's immediate and close proximity to the proposal, the council and or ARC have not undertaken any obvious documented and detailed risk assessment to consider the impact on the children who attend the nursery and construct a robust management plan to control plans to adequately safeguard. Item two. We understand that this proposal has not been passed to children's services for comment and assessment in line with requirements to ensure safeguarding requirements. To date, we have received no formal policy or assessment as to the profiling of clients to any previous activity, which could give rise to foreseeable risks for safeguarding. Item three, we have no oversight of any management plan or risk assessment, which adequately demonstrates a robust control process to account for noise, safety, antisocial behavior, and the effect of minimising of loss of privacy and overlooking. Section 12 of planning policy states that planning decisions should ensure that developments do not undermine the quality of life or community cohesion and should ensure the privacy of neighbours by preventing overlooking. As this is a new application, these criteria must be observed. In turn, the nursery has received a large number of verbal notifications of concern from parents who also raise the question of the ability for this to be managed in a safe and effective way. Item four, Prenton Road West is a convenient and busy road for vehicles and deliveries. We have two dentist practices, a church, a day nursery, a restaurant, a number of shops and two public houses. This coupled with a football club who holds regular events. Planning policy HS4 and HS13 states that there should be adequate off street parking. We believe that the readily dismissal of a suitable and sufficient traffic management plan for the site reflects a lack of compliance to the planning requirements and does not account for visiting family, friends, support workers, health professionals, and those clients who are on a positive pathway and may indeed have a vehicle. Item five, HS4 of policy states that the development should provide adequate individual, private, or communal garden space to each dwelling for recreation for each client. To date, no effective plan has been presented to fulfill this requirement. Item six, scale. The former residential home has a documented history of being a 10 place setting with 24 seven care and management teams on site. And we are unable to ascertain why it is formally, formally being quoted as a 15 place setting. The proposal to have 15 self-contained flats with no time resources and management on site is not the like for like equivalent, which is being planned. 
This is in contradiction to HS13 and HS4. Number seven, the proposal represents a significant shift in the character of the area and will have a detrimental impact on the community. The area is ne nearly all privately owned with generous footprints and living spaces and residents are long-standing and integrated. The proposal to have a transient population, which is over 50% greater than the previous client base and consolidated on such a small footprint with no identified external recreation areas would be a unique and detrimental to the community and in no way relates to the surrounding properties. On behalf of the 200 plus residents, community objectors and those plus persons who signed the petition, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to present these issues and ask that they be given primary consideration, consideration into the, uh, in relation to the welfare of the most vulnerable sector of our society, children, and ask that they work with us in meeting legislative requirements by placing children at the centre of everything we do to consider the impact upon local community and residents in relation to material planning requirements which we believe are not adequately addressed. The purpose of the government direction on homeless policy is not to take precedence of its direction on safeguarding and adherence to planning requirements. We feel that it is crucial to public confidence that decisions taken by local government on behalf of the public have been taken in a proper, fair and transparent way and that the process is working for the benefit of the local community and request that this proposal is rejected to allow meaningful consultation and ensure necessary risk assessments and safeguarding issues can be addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Slightly over four minutes. We'll, we'll Apologise. No okay. Um, do any members of the committee um, have any questions of, uh, of of Mr. Williams? Within the case in the chat box. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, I've got Bruce Barry. Bruce, I could ask you a question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Mr. Williams, um, my question is to do with um, the concerns that you have with um, safeguarding. <clears throat> and um, could you tell me? Um, I don't know if you have a copy of the, the floor plan um, or the 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 um, the, the actual uh, orientation of the property, but um, from what I'm looking at at the moment, when I look at the um, the elevation, which is from the southwest, which is showing the side of the building which faces onto your property. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the windows that will be obscured, but there's yeah. also some other windows which are more to the rear of the property, yes. which are at a 30 degree angle to the property, to the to the original building. And can you tell me, um, are those windows which will not be obscured, are they looking onto your onto your playing area within the school? Yes, they are. There has been a proposal to put a control measure in place of a two metre high fence, but you only need to move a very short distance away from that fence to, to see full access. It looks directly onto my um, my, my grassed area, which the, the, the children use each day. The guidance from Ofsted and the Early Years Foundation is to have the children outside as much as possible. And we meet that need by careful risk assessments, by having wet, wet, um, wet, weir, wet weather gear, and we do spend a, a large proportion of the day in the garden. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Um, uh, Kathy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you. Kathy, you've managed to mute yourself. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? You are. We can hear. You. Um, yes, I, I'd like to know. Um, can you tell me um, uh, what are the opening times of the nursery, and are the children supervised at all times by staff? Hi, Cathy. Yeah, of course, we have strict ratios with childcare and it depends on the age group of the child. Um, the opening times of the nursery are 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 p.m. Um, we, we currently are open at the moment running a skeleton shift to support the key workers. But um, they, obviously, we, we adhere to all the Ofsted principles when it comes to, to safeguarding and, and um, childcare ratios. There is supervision in place. So there, there, are, there are no children at the premises in the evening or at the weekend? There's no children in the premises. The only time that occurs, Cathy, is we sometimes hold events in order to promote community events. 
We have a, a nine meter gazebo, which we often use to have um, birthday parties, um, community events, and, and, and. So we do sometimes do an event on a weekend, but they are ad hoc. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That's Chairs, where's he and thanks, Chair. Thank, thanks, Mr. Balloons, for your presentation. And I uh, just to confirm, I, I've read your emails and, and I've taken all the points you raised into consideration and will do. Uh, take any, any further points uh, that are raised during the meeting into consideration before reaching my decision. Um, I I'm, don't wish to sound inflammatory, but I'm just wondering why would a homeless person pose more of a risk than a care home resident? Just, just, I'll be, I'll be. It's not a problem, it's a good question. And I, I want to I want to make this very clear. I don't believe that homeless people um are, are some kind of um criminal underworld or that they have a an, an unnecessary level of risk. But under the guidelines, I I CRB check all my people. That's one of my requirements. We've got a, a very, very material change to the concept of what we had next door. Uh, with a much more transient population. So things have changed. We're not having a like-for-like -like situation. We had uh, a maximum of 10 old people that generally spent time in communal areas downstairs who who did not spend long periods of time in the in the um, accommod bed sit type accommodation. They were actually downstairs in the communal areas. Now, those communal areas are a lot lower. They're actually below my ground level from 67 uh, side. Uh, now we've got something completely different. We've got a situation where somebody doesn't have any um, open space to, to have any recreation and predominantly is, is confined to a, a bed set with the only opportunity to maybe go and get recreation by walk. And so a, a big dynamic has changed. And what we need to do is just assess that risk. That's all, that, that, that's all safeguarding is about. It's not to make judgments. It's to have a constructive dialogue with the people who propose these initiatives so that we can make a risk assessment and make sure that we comply with what we should be doing. Okay, thanks for that. Can I ask Sam Frost? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, I just wanted to pick up uh, on the question that you um, gave an answer to in response to um, Councillor um, Hudson. Um, the weekend events that you mentioned, um, yeah. just, just for clarity, so um, you said there were no children unsupervised on site um, during the week. Yeah. Are there children unsupervised on the site during these ad hoc weekend events or is there always a member of staff or a parent or carer? We keep to the same ratio, Sam. Right. Okay. So there are, there are never children unsupervised? Good God, no. We've been operating for over 22 years. We've never had a complaint off a resident or an objection when we've gone to planning. Uh, we've got a very good reputation. We don't have a website. We don't advertise. We rely on repeat business from word of mouth. And we often have, uh, we're, we're on the fourth child of a particular family at the moment. So it means a lot to us and we, we adhere to the strict principles of safeguarding uh, and risk, risk avoidance. Great, thank you. Thank you, thanks Sam. Okay, there's, there's no further members indicating the risk test question. Mr Williams, thank you for your presentation. Okay. And I will ask now um, for the applicants to join us. If they could turn their experiment and video on. Hi. Okay, let's see. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'm just waiting for your video to come through. Is that okay? Um, so uh, we have um, the applicant and the agent with us. Um, how, how are you proposing to handle this um, in terms of the five minutes, um, Mr. Pigard? Are you are you proposing to to speak for, to us for five minutes? Uh, no, uh, I'm planning on handing almost entirely over to uh, to Aidan on behalf of Wirralark. I believe the personal nature and the operational strategy here is best coming from the operator rather than the uh, the architect. Okay, thank you. So, um, is the applicant? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear see me? I, I can hear and see you now. Good. Okay. Um, in common with the um, uh, with, with the objector, you will have. Uh, five minutes to uh, address us, following which there may be some questions of communication from the um, uh, from the committee. Um, so if you begin now, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so my name is Aidan Jamal. I'm the Chief Exec at Wirralark. Um, we've been delivering projects of this type, one type or another, for about 25 years now. 
Um, just wanted to give an overview of what this project is. Um, so this is what we would describe as a move on project. So this is for people with the lowest support needs. So this is typically people who've made 90% of their journey successfully, but they're not quite ready to move into their own place. Um, we support people who are in these projects with things like budgeting, tenancy finding, opening bank accounts, attending appointments and going to social activities. Um, the type of clients that we placed here <clears throat> are not, um, for example, complex clients, living chaotic behaviour, not people who are daily drinkers, um, <clears throat> not people who are drug users, um, not people with recent offending history. Um, the maximum stay with this project is typically up to 12 months maximum. Very rarely it's less than six months, so the six to 12 month range is, is about normal. All clients are fully assessed before they come to the building. Um, that's more a deeper assessment than you would get with a simple CRB. We spirit, speak directly to police, we speak to probation, we speak to their social workers if they've had one. Um, we speak to other charities that they've worked with. Um, and this is done in line with the kind of same process that is done across um, the whole of Merseyside. All the local authorities and, and charity uh, commission charities uh, work in the same way to that respect. Um, so we have a full and comprehensive picture of each, who, who each person is. We don't place people unless we think they'll succeed. Um, it's purely from a charitable perspective. There's no value in putting someone in a project who will then fail. So it's someone who we expect uh, at the end of their stay to be ready to move on into their you know, permanent housing. Um, uh, as part of that assessment, we do check for um, child sexual offence histories. Uh, anybody who has any sort of offence, not only do people have been proved, but people where there is a suspicion of such will not be allowed in the building. Um, and the majority of people, that, nearly all the people that are there, will simply just trying to <clears throat> get on live their daily lives and just get ready to, to move out at the end of it. Um, in terms of the um, internal layout of the building, very little has changed. Um, most of our clients um, you know, are not highly personable, so they will spend most of their time in their flat. They do have friends in you know, other places, so we'll come and go. They'll have appointments to attend. Um, some will even be trying to find work. Um, but there won't be a significant amount of congregation. There'll be no public areas per se, other than you know, corridors and a, and a washing room. Um, so most of the clients that are there will simply be kind of quietly getting on with their life. And that's our experience in, you know, the all the other projects that we deliver. We have about 30 units at any given time of people living this type of uh, this type of move on project. Um, <clears throat> and it would be uh, unfair to categorize them as kind of chaotic or, or difficult people. Um, obviously, they, they struggle, but they tend to struggle internally. They struggle with paying bills. They struggle with doing their daily shopping. They struggle to get to appointments and, and things of that type, and that's what we're there to support them with. Um, so it was the, the project itself, from our perspective, is a fairly light touch one. It's for the, absolutely the top end in terms of simplicity of clients. All the complex clients go to different types of projects where they get the right support that they need. Um, and and I, I suspect that what most local residents would find is actually it's a fairly straightforward project there. Chair, you're on mute. Thank you very much. That was uh, well within five minutes. Um, okay, questions from members. Um, we've got Alan Bray. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jamal, for your presentation. Could I just ask, is there any form of control over visitors to uh, the, the accommodation? Um, so we have rules around who can visit. During the day, we can um, have small numbers of visitors into each room because friends are allowed to visit. No one's allowed to stay over overnight. However, because this is a, a monitored public space, we have, as, as you go in, there's an entranceway by the front door, and that will be monitored through CCTV. And we do keep an eye on that, not live, but retrospectively, to see who's been coming and going. Uh, and so, therefore, we make sure that we're, we keep an eye on who's there. During kind of the day, uh, in the kind of Monday to Friday days, um, there'll be staff typically based around there. So we see the comings and goings as well. Um, and we, you know, our, our experience is that we, because we, we're so close to the, the, the clients, we tend to know their friendship groups and know what their patterns are. Um, so people can come and go, but clearly you don't have, um, you know, we're very mindful to that we don't want lots of people going into the flat because that doesn't help the client themselves. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Ian Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask you, uh, Mr. Jamal, um, has there been, you've heard yourself, presumably, what Mr. Williams had to say earlier, uh, some of the concerns that he outlined. 
uh, in his presentation. Have you, have you or, or SDA undertaken any consultation with either Mr. Williams directly or with the immediate community prior to this application being heard tonight? Yes, I've spoken to Mr. Williams a couple of times and I'd just like to kind of thank him for approaching those conversations in, in, you know, in, in the correct spirit. Uh, I've spoken to several of the local residents as well and have a couple of email exchanges with, with people as well. Uh, in terms of the kind of public dissemination of information, we've just chosen to go through the, the public documentation that the council publishes rather than doing wide scale public events or things of that time. But we have been happy to engage with people who raised any queries. Uh, one of the local councillors did put a leaflet through most people's doors um, well, probably about six weeks ago now, just indicating that this was uh, imminent and, and that gave a, a contact reference in our organisation if people had any queries. Um, but most queries only came through in the last kind of two weeks or so. OK, thank you. No further questions from me. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Barry. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, just a quick question, if I may. Um, in, in our paperwork on page uh, 16, paragraph 336, it says uh, residents will be single males and females under the age of 25 who need an element of support to help them to maintain their tenancy. They will be on licence. Um, this is something that rather concerns me. Can you tell me, out of the proposed 15 residents, how many of them will actually be on licence? Thank you. So, good, good question. Just to clarify there, this is not licence as in licence from prison. This is licence as in this is their tenancy agreement. So normally if you were in, you know, if I were to rent a, a, a flat off the high street, I have an assured short hold tenancy or something like that. The most light touch version of, of your tenancy agreement is called a licence. So this is nothing to do with an offending history. Uh, this is to do with the, the type of tenancy that they have. So all of the clients who are in the building will be on licence. That's typical for the homelessness sector. It essentially means that we can ask people to leave with one day's notice. Um, and we don't need to go through a lengthy kind of process in order to evict people who don't agree with, uh, you know, the, the, the rules of the house. OK, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Steve Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, basically, uh, Bruce actually asked the question I was going to ask, but I'll ask another. Um, it was described in the report that this is midterm accommodation. And just to give me an idea of the what sort of level the people who are going to be living in the premises i take it they provide their own shopping cook their own meals and they are fairly self-sufficient to a certain degree yeah that's correct so they've got their own kitchenette so they'll typically do their own shopping prepare their own food um, and do their own budgeting different people have different issues and so that's why we have staff who are available to help them out with some of those things um but in terms of you know we, we're not providing meals for people um, we're not, um, you know, doing their shopping for them. Um, we don't hold their money for them. They have all of these things themselves. And if they're struggling with one of those things, that's where our support workers get them up to speed on it. Uh, but otherwise, it's yet yeah, independent living in each of those units. Thank you, Mr. Joel. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jamal, for your presentation. Um, I had a few questions and, and fellow councillors have picked most of them up. Um, just two, really. I think um, the on-licence definition that you mentioned, it's really helpful. Um, if, if you could just um, kind of restate that, I guess, for those who are participating or listening at home. I know from the resident contacts that I've had, an awful lot of them interpreted on licence, it seems, uh, in an incorrect way. So if you wouldn't mind just restating that. Um, and then if you could also just share a little bit of experience um, from any other managed facilities that you've got or anywhere else across Merseyside on what the kind of light touch um, facilities look like in terms of the interaction with neighbours, that would be helpful. Thank you. Certainly. Um, so just to clarify, the, the, the licence referred to in the document is the tenancy type. Uh, it's, the, it's the kind of the most insecure, in essence, uh, type of tenancy that you have. But there's a range of things going, you know, a short, short, hot tenancy is the one that a lot of people will know from their, from their own renting. Um, so it is licence in terms of that's the type of tenancy agreement that they have, nothing to do with, um, you know, uh, a release from prison or a probation arrangement. Um, in terms of our experience on the similar projects, um, in terms of the impact on neighbours, did you mean? Can I just clarify yes. that? 
yeah that's fine um so we've got two different types of project one a couple of slightly larger buildings hmos and uh, several houses that are just two up two down terraces um in, in all our experiences there's very very little concern from neighbors simply because um the coming like the, the problems our clients have tend to be internal they tend to be problems with finances they tend to be problems with getting work it's we don't put people in those projects who are you know chaotic drinkers and hang around with lots of other people who are the same therefore the type of issues don't tend to um and to for outwards if you like and um, what we do do we have had issues you know, over 25 years we've had the odd issue um, where there's a concern because we have a 24-hour hostel and we have a 24-hour call service we're always able to respond to things typically it tends to be that um residents will contact us about kind of small bits and pieces like you know i don't know um ogre and hedges and things of that type that we can then pick up uh, and respond to um but actually the, the type of uh, significant issue that would have a major daily impact on people's lives that, that exist in our other projects and tend not to uh, in similar projects most of our houses for instance the two or two downs the neighbors will have no idea that it's a homeless project um because people just live there normally thank you uh, thank you um Brian Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jamal said that this was a what he described as a move on project with people 90% ready to move on in their life. And I think he also said that there would be no drug users, problem drinkers, etc. Can I just clarify? Will any of the intended residents for this for the premises be either recent or repeat offenders could you clarify that point please thank you um so they certainly won't so we do it on a risk assessment basis in the sense of we we assess what that the risk of that person is um it, it's, it's difficult to refine recent if somebody had an offending history from four years ago would that be considered recent if they'd been completely straightforward since then and turned their life around during that period? Um, what we don't do is we put people there who we think are engaged with crime or at a lapse of kind of, you know, going back to offending behaviour. Um, so in that respect, there's certainly nobody who we know to be a current offender would be placed there. Um, as I say, historic is it, slightly difficult to draw a line. Clearly, you couldn't say people who committed a crime 20 years ago couldn't be there. But at the same time, um, you know, um, we don't put people in there who we think are at risk of causing trouble again. Um, so that's part of the assessment in terms of actually assessing their uh, material offending history. But we do a much deeper assessment. We have a strong relationship with our clients where we assess where, um, you know, we, we, we judge where they are in terms of their own development. And if we think that that person is not even necessarily at risk of causing a crime, um, but is simply not able to live in an independent way, then we won't place that person in there in the first place. Sadly, there is such a significant amount of homeless people around. It's not like we need to um, place chaotic people in there simply to meet the need. Um, there are a significant number of people who, um, without any offending history, will still easily be able to fill the accommodation that exists on the world. Um, so there'll be no pressure to put people in there who are inappropriate. Okay, thanks for that, Steve Fouch. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in a number of the correspondence I've read from residents and the like, they, they make references and comparisons with some of the portfolio of properties you have within the ARC. Um, it, I will, can you answer, are they a fair comparison, say, comparing, uh, you know, this type of accommodation with one of your, uh, the, the, the one of the one in Birkenhead, for example? And if you have a property that is similar to that, can you quote its record uh, and how it's uh, embedded in the community? Um, it's almost a similar question to Sam Frost asked, but uh, are they comparing apples and pears or have you something comparable that you can quote to us? Sure. So um, so the, we have a 27 bedroom hostel, which is our kind of our, our biggest building. So obviously it's smaller than that. Uh, that's a 24 seven staff building where we only deal with probably the most chaotic people on the Wirral. So obviously it's nothing like that, but um, in terms of building management and, you know, looking after the space, then, you know, we, we've got a lot of experience there. In terms of the clients, it's actually far more similar to our other move on accommodation. We have a six bedroom converted pub, a six bedroom uh, HMO, and then a number of 
terraced houses um, in Bir uh, Birkenhead and Wallasey. Um, in terms of the, 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 the shape of the building, it's, it's different to those. It's most similar to the converted pub, but it's obviously it's got its own uh, characteristics. But the types of clients that we place there and the kind of issues that they have, uh, it'll be exactly, well, if I'd like to touch it, I should say, than the majority of the other the projects that we have. We have some commissioned and some non-commissioned work, and the, the commissioned work is slightly higher um, needs um, than our others. Um, so in terms of dealing with those clients, I mean, I think we have 27, uh, 29 units uh, elsewhere um, of move-on accommodation. All of those clients are of a similar type, um, and so we have a lot of experience in that respect. Uh, in terms of their uh, kind of engagement with their local area, I mean, they're, they're typical to the local area. The, the places in which they're based, people tend to just kind of get on with their lives. Some of them know their neighbours, some don't. Um, very rare for us to get anti-social behaviour problems. Um, typically, it's, you know, it's simply that people are coming in and out and, and getting on with themselves. Okay, thanks a lot, Steve. That's Chair Wessingham. And thanks, Chair, and f thanks, Mr. Jamal, for your presentation. Uh, I think, I think, before I ask the question, I think it's just probably worth uh, pointing out, you know, confirming uh, section three point three point six. It's for males and females over the age of twenty-five. I've also heard earlier uh, it was on, someone said it was under. Uh, I think it's probably we have sent over. And um, so, obviously, the welfare of uh, you know, the clients the ARC deal with is also a safeguarding issue, as well as the, as well as obviously the safeguarding issues around the nursery. Um, I was wondering, in your, the risk assessments you you undertake, um, have you taken into account the fact that you're being next door to a nursery? Yeah, so um, you know, whenever we place somebody into a building, we take into account all of the um, all of the considerations there. So clearly, um, we won't put anybody there who is inappropriate to be next to a nursery. Um, we then also think about you know social groups in the area where they might look for work, travel issues, and these all go into the support package and the risk assessment, which kind of go hand in hand when we assess people. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we'll we kind of consider the local area um, when we consider who we're going to place there. Um, and then just to just to confirm your point, yes, this is for project for people twenty five and over, not twenty five and under. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, you, you mentioned um, uh, one of the um, properties that you've got, which is a six bedroom converted pub. Is that the uh, the Grand Trunk on Old Bidston Road? Sorry, you crackled for a second there. Could you just repeat that question? The Grand, the Grand Trunk at Old Bidston Road. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I make a comment or shall I leave my comments to later on, Stuart, as chair? Well, the, 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 these are questions, so... Okay. Uh, I'll leave it there. I'll comment later okay. on then. Okay, thank you. Um, and Steve Hayes wants to come back. Future. Yes. Uh, yeah. In some of the email correspondence, there was some sort of references to the Ark in Birkenhead and some comparisons. And I was wondering if you could sort of explain if there's any differences between the um, new planning application in Trenton and the existing Ark in Birkenhead. How similar are they or dissimilar? Yeah, so the, the, our main building, which is known as the Ark, um, is near Hamilton Square in Birkenhead, and that's a completely opposite end of the scale. So it's a recently refurbished 27-bedroom hostel. That is for people who've been street sleeping, um, people who've got repeat offending history, people who are daily drinkers and, and so on. Um, and so, as, as you might expect, homeless services need to accommodate all different people on the spectrum from those kind of clients through to the kind of clients that would be based in um in, in Prenton Road at the very light end of the scale and the kind of stable end of the scale so very much at kind of opposites um as it were uh, as I mentioned it is a large building so you know from a maintenance and repairs perspective we've got experience doing that but it, otherwise it is very different thank you uh, thanks for that Steve um no other members have indicated um thank you very much for your um presentation uh, and we'll now hear from the ward councillors. I think we're going to hear from Councillor Norbury first. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for everyone who's um, given the presentation so far. It's all very interesting. 
and things are coming to uh, to to light. I think that 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 weren't before. So I'd just like to open really by saying it, it is widely recognised um, that austerity that we've had for over a decade has created a lot of homelessness. Um, the, the, the economics of the area have been affected by that, and, and Whittle's no exception. I wish I wish this wasn't the case, but it, but it is. There is a, a strong need for these for for homeless establishments and for people to 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 be rehabilitated and move on. And that's through no fault of their own, um, as I've just said, you know. I would like to say as a long serving, as the longest serving Preton Labour councillor for almost 10 years now, how heartened I was to receive emails from the residents of Preton praising the work of Whittle Ark to do in safeguarding, protecting the homeless of the borough. These are my values too as a Labour councillor. It was great to hear from the from the Ark and some residents have contacted them and we research what type of service Abbey Field Project has the potential to be. So that was heartening for me that people were doing research. They weren't just um, complaining and moaning. They were doing the research and looking into in, into into the project and, and the usefulness of it. You know, it was important to the people of Preton that the type of profession and homeless rehabilitation service is situated in the right place and within the right community match taking into consideration planning law, policy, and the perception of fears of the people of Prenton towards the potential service users. And we've heard a little bit about that, and we've heard from the ARC um, that, that maybe that wasn't the case because there was a lot of confusion around this word, license. The potential service users are articulated, the objections and in the petition, and um, I've heard from all the councillors on the committee that they fully read them uh, documentation, they've fully read the petition and they fully read all the emails that have been sent to them by the by the residents of Prenton. I've been contacted by at least 10 residents and this is part of my presentation, taking the emails that they've sent me, you know. Butter Butter Council wants to create a safe, friendly environment in Prenton for existing residents and for those, you know, the who've got the potential for joining the community, which is what Abbey Field's about, where people will be joining our community in Prenton for a short space of time while we, they move on to, to get their own safe, affordable, affordable home, hopefully. The people of Prenton who live closest to Abbeyfield do not think that this location is the right place for the planning reasons already articulated to the planning committee which I assume all members of the committee have read, yeah, and I've heard clarification of that. I just want to touch on a few, if I may, Chair, such as the lack of amenity space for cars, adding to an already busy road, particularly on match days with TRFC being in cl close pro proximity. So I've read, I've read the agenda and I've, I've read this look, the piece around um, cars, and there seems to be an assumption from planning officers that people moving into Abbey Field on the, on the short-term licence won't have a vehicle. So I would like the um, committee really to, to explore that and the council officers who have made that as assumption uh, back that up a little bit really, because as far as I'm concerned, if people are looking for a safe, warm, affordable home for themselves, they will probably have to at some stage seek some sort of employment. And I'm assuming that that's part of this journey where they, they, they will be um, applying for jobs and there's more likelihood of people getting jobs if they've got a vehicle. So that assumption that people won't be arriving at Abbey Field with a vehicle, I think is an assumption. And there's a, I think there's a strong possibility that they will um, acquire a vehicle um, in, 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 during their stay at Abbey Field and there's no guarantee that they won't. So I'd like that to be clarified as well. There is reference to change of use from C2 to C3. I think this has already been talked about, where the uh, original um, home was a, was a caring home for up to 10 residents, I, I've been told. I'm, I'm not sure on the clarification of that. But this, this new um, facility obviously has 15 uh, residents um, in there for, for, on a short-term uh, license, on a short-term lease. So... Um, it isn't like for like, is it? You know, it's it's gone from 10 to 15, so I'm not sure where the like to like comes in, and I'd like the committee to clarify that 
and I'll elaborate on, on why it's been called like for like. I've also spoken to Wirral Ark, who have reassured me regarding some of the uh, perceptions articulated by the nearby residents. I'm aware that some sort of leaflet went out to heighten people's concerns. So, um, you know, I, I started getting a lot of um, traffic, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls w within the last week or so. So I believe some sort of leaflet went out um, again around the area. So I'm not sure quite what happened uh, regarding that. But I do want to say that um, I don't know why Whittle, what a council planning department has chosen to, um, to do the planning uh, process as it has. Because as the guy said from Willow Ark and, and the guy and uh, Neil said from, from Abbeyfield, I think this would have been much better, and I know we're in difficult times, but it would have been much better to be more open and transparent. And one of the reasons for that has been articulated by one of the residents in that there is a little bit of a conflict of interest here because Wirral Ark is supported by Wirral Borough Council, and this is a Wirral Borough Council planning uh, process. So I'd like um, the committee really to just reassure the residents and myself that there isn't a conflict of interest and, and that has been uh, fully, fully explored. Okay, um, the residents of Penn are looking for the, for the, you know, at the worst fears to be mitigated by the planning committee and to be assured, reassured by the planning process that like the, the like self safeguarding of children who attend the building box nursery is 100% taken care of. And that's a, a real theme that's come out today. I, I did have a look at the site and I know there hasn't been a site visit and, and members may benefit from having a site visit when we're in um, more normal times. But I believe um, uh, an officer has been out um, to have a site visit with Neil and, um, and a recommendation was made from that. I may be confused over that. Clarification is welcome. That a two metre wall will be rectified uh, to keep um, the, the privacy of the, of the nursery and the um and and the homeless facility um so uh, some sort of site visit has taken place but i know all councillors weren't involved in that so there is a lot of concern regarding the proximity uh to the outdoor play area um to the homeless facility can a planning commission please reassure us that every every single safeguard in every single aspect uh, regarding the children because there's a lot of concern around that is going to be taken, that the risk assessments are going to be done, and, and our own children's service have, have been included in that. There was um, some sort of um, indication that this service was going to be used as some sort of emergency um, place as well. You know, so people could come and, and stay there on an emergency basis. So I'd, I'd I'd like the planning committee to clarify that. Um, that, that seems to have come across uh, from some of the from some of the res residents, and I think um, the, the 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 information regarding the criminal activity, which has been a perceived um, claim from some of the residents who have emailed me, may have been um, mitigated in in what the Wirral Ark have said. Uh, this word license being being a confusion around that. There is a, a yard at the back of Abbey, Abbey Field where um, some of the some of the residents have indicated that there has been antisocial behaviour at that yard at the back of Abbey Field and at the back of the nursery, and police have been involved in in moving people on who were drinking and and doing all sorts in that backyard. So residents have indicated to me that that's a potential uh, problem. It could be a potential problem because it has been indicated that the garden area in, in, the, in the homeless um, place is not very big at all. And I've viewed this, this garden and it isn't very big at all. So there is a little bit of difficulty of where the residents are going to go, the 15 residents are going to go for recreational, for smoking and stuff like that, you know, hoping they're not going to congregate around this backyard area and cause any um, disturbance to the existing residents. So I'd like the committee to assure me that um, as much as possible, uh, this won't happen. I must also ask in respect of um, Council have called a climate emergency 
I haven't seen, I may have missed it, that there's been an environmental impact assessment done on this application because it is, um, as I said before, a lot more people are moving in. Is the carbon footprint going to be increased? Has there been mitigation put forward to prevent the carbon footprint from being in increased? I have seen that they've been um, instructed by, via the planning officers to, to have a cycle rack um, at the premises, and, and I know that's going to be put in place. But will there be adequate recycling facilities, and and will the uh, you know will the building be modified in any way to reduce the carbon output? Have we have we got an environmental assessment? So just in in conclusion, the people of Prenton just want to know that this planning application is passed. A fair established safe community will not be adversely affected by the homeless people who are now on their journey to a safe, affordable home and need to stay in the community of Prenton for a short time while they complete that journey. And we fully respect um, what the ARC is saying about that. You know, um, people need to be respected and safeguarded and that journey needs to be supported by professionals and the community as well. We want the, our community in Prenton to support that journey if this planning application is successful and the people of Prenton have been uh, probably uh, reassured that no criminal activity or their peace of mind and their perception of, of maybe the crimes that they were, were were told about in these leaflets or whatever will, will not will not happen so that we need the planning committee really to reassure us and we have had some reassurance already from um, um, the guys at the Ark there you know I strongly believe from correspondence I have received if the planning committee can reassure the people of Preton that their community will not be ad adversely affected and, and answer the questions that have been asked, then the people of Preton will reach out and help make that journey successful and as, as successful and as safe one as possible. So I'm, I'm leaving it to the planning committee really to, to answer some of them concerns. Some of them have already been answered, but I'll leave it there if I may, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Does any members have any questions for Councillor Norby? No. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Cook. Are you there? Hello there. Can you see me and hear me? I can hear you, I can see you now. Good, uh, right. Okay, thank you. Okay, ready, ready to go then? Okay, right, thank you. I appreciate much of what I'll be saying here has already been covered because I'm speaking uh, relatively late in the day, but I'll go ahead and say what I intended to say uh, as I originally planned it. Okay, so uh, in making this submission to the planning committee, uh, I'd first of all like to explain for the benefit of residents following this meeting who may not be familiar with the way the council operates, that councillors have to wear two hats. On the one hand, as a ward councillor, our role is to represent constituents' views and interests to the council, including this committee. I will summarise what, in my view, were the most significant of these later. On the other hand, as an elected member of Wirral Borough Council, I'm also bound to consider the interests of Wirral people as a whole and have regard to national and local policies and priorities. Currently, there is a consensus at a national and local level that homelessness urgently needs to be tackled by providing suitable supported accommodation. I have examined and discussed the Wirral Art Project with as many of the relevant parties as possible. Back in mid-March, I met Wirral Arc agent Jack, Jackie Snell, who took me on a tour around Abbeyfield House and explained the project in detail. I obtained further information from the Council's planning case officer circulated information about the application for today's meeting. This was six days ago, not six weeks ago, by the way, when I circulated information to residents. Um, and I've listened to the views of those who have contacted me about the project in recent weeks and months and replied to many emails over the last 48 hours in particular. Um, Commissioned by the Council, Wirral Ark is a key provider in helping homeless people to access supported accommodation and eventually supporting them into independent living. This current project is to provide much needed move on accommodation with light touch support for people who are almost ready to take the final step into completely 
independent living. I know you've heard that several times this evening already. Just thought I'd uh, repeat it. Uh, speaking for myself, as someone who works with children and as a teacher, where safeguarding is a primary concern, even uh, over and above education, I would need to be completely satisfied that the very small children attending the nursery next door were absolutely safe. Over the past two decades, Building Blocks Nursery has had a consistently good Ofsted rating in every category, including safeguarding. I understand that there are typically between 20 and 40 children attending at any one time, with a staff ratio of 1 to 3 for 2-year-olds, 1 to 4 for 3-year-olds, and 1 to 8 uh, for 4-year-olds. So with up to 40 children at any one time, there will always be several qualified staff present, carrying out a safeguarding as well as educational role. And we've heard that's confirmed um, a number of times this evening, or as particularly by the petitioner. I understand also that future residents of Ab Abbeyfield House would be risk assessed by various agencies and would not be considered for this sort of accommodation if they were unsuitable to reside in close proximity to a children's nursery. I have seen Abbeyfield's rear garden very recently, which isn't conducive to large gatherings of residents, as most of the space is taken up by a rear and side extension. The nursery and preschool children use their rear garden for play and learning frequently throughout the day. This raises legitimate questions around the potential for any antisocial behaviour impacting negatively on the operation of the nursery. I understand that a substantial two metre fence would be erected on the Abbeyfield house side and five windows overlooking, overlooking the nursery from the top floor obscured. There is, however, a concern that the nursery garden could at a stretch be viewed from the top, the upper part of the windows on the first floor. I have the following concerns about supervision of the residents. As there are envisaged to be so many residents at the facility, both men and women, ideally, in my view, if it were approved, at least in the early stages of the project, Wirral Arc staff should be present at all times managing security, or at least during the working day and while the nursery is in operation, and attending to residents' needs. I appreciate, however, that if it continued for any length of time, such on-site supervision would undermine the rationale of the project, which is to create a regime of near independent living for the residents. If it emerged that extra resources were required in order to support the residents, I hope that Wirral Arc would be in a position to offer this, even if extra funding were required, and if necessary, back by the council. Although one full-time and one part-time Wirral Arc workers would be available on call to the residents during office hours on weekdays, and there would be an emergency line, a call line at other times, including weekends, this presumably would depend on a resident or residents taking the initiative to call the helpline. If a serious situation occurred but none of the residents at the facility call the helpline, I'm concerned that it would be left to other residents in the road or in the immediate area to call the police for an intervention. The Agenda Reports Pack states that a persistent noise disturbance will be dealt with by environmental health, as in other residential situations. However, it would be reasonable to expect Wirral Arc to take immediate action in such cases and remove residents from the facility if necessary. And I've heard this evening that uh, Wirral Arc have the authority, the facility to do this uh, within 24 hours if necessary. Um, I'm also concerned that the four other facilities, and this has been mentioned and questioned uh, about quite a few times this evening, uh, I'm also concerned that the four of the facilities cited in the reports pack under paragraph 3.3.2 are not equivalent to what is proposed for Abbeydale, uh, Abbeyfield House in terms of the regimes they operate and the location. For example, the Medical House, 7 Sydney Street, Birkenhead, the nearest in size with 27 residents is a hostel with on-site support and supervision. Again, I apologise for repeating that point. Uh, the Abbeyfield House project which would offer move-on accommodation, therefore, appears to be entering uncharted territory to some extent. If not managed well, the establishment of a new immunity on Prenton Road West could lead to the closing of another, the local nursery school. If this closed, parents would have to find places for their children elsewhere, 
thus placing extra pressure on often already oversubscribed nurseries. Closure of the nursery would also diminish the immunity of the area, a concern expressed by many residents. I think it is important, therefore, that a condition of this application, if approved, should be that Wirral Ark must maintain a close and regular dialogue with Building Blocks Nursery to enable both to run successfully. And I would ask the committee uh, to consider this as an additional condition. OK. Um, uh, I thank you, Tony, for uh, uh, Councillor Tony Norbury for making the, uh, this final point that I'm going to reinforce. Um, and that is the fact that only 10 letters were apparently sent uh, to local residents living in the immediate area around the site of the proposed project. Uh, I strongly feel that the council should adopt a policy of directly consulting with residents living in a much wider radius where important applications such as this are to be considered. This would help to improve how the council is perceived by residents and promote transparency and local democracy. Um, and just to finish off, the, 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 the bicycle store that was mentioned by Councillor Norbury, uh, as I understand it, um, is to be covered uh, and secured, not, not just a, a bicycle rack. Um, but I would like further clarity on this if possible. And one final thing, uh, there is reference in the report documents to um, a variety of shared facilities, um, you know, including uh, cooking um, and a lounge, uh, so social um, facilities as well, uh, not just washing. Now, I've been told by World Art that, in fact, uh, residents will only be sharing um, uh, washing facilities. So I think this needs to be clarified, if possible, at some point this evening. OK, I'll, I'll leave it there and um, answer questions if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Um, yes, I've just been told off by Cathy for not giving people long enough. Uh, Cathy, you had a question. You were probably hoping to aim it at uh, Tony Norbury, but uh, if you ask your question, I invite both councillors to give their perspective on it. Well, actually, it, it was a, a question to Councillor Norbury, but... It's a, it's a question to both of the ward councillors, actually, because having listened to both of them, I'm not sure that there was an awful lot of content to do with planning law. And I'm still not sure whether either of those councillors are in favour or against the application. Neither of them, I don't think, have actually said whether they're in favour or against. Could we know, please? Well, and the, the, all the councillors need to do is to give their perspective and to, mm. to raise concerns. I, I don't know whether... He, no. he, Members would come back. Or... No. Well, well, I'd be happy to. Uh, in my introductory remarks, can I be heard? Sorry, am I? Yes, you can. Yes, yes. Sorry, uh, I, I made it clear that uh, you know the the council, in my view, has it has a dual role to, to represent, uh, to try and summarise uh, the key concerns of residents, you know, and and also at the same time to to understand the the, the broader picture, you know, the holistic approach of the of the authority in tackling. Um, the issue that we have in, in, in front of us here, which is, of course, homelessness, and there is a national imperative for that. Um, my own personal view on this, um, I am, you know, um, I have my reservations, as I've made clear about the project, um, but I think ultimately it's for the for the, the councillors on the committee to decide, you know. Um, I have my own perspective, uh, but... Um, you know, I think in this particular case, it's more constructive for me to to represent the concerns that I that have come my way in discussing the the application with residents. That's Thank right. you, uh, Tony. Do you want to? Uh, did you want to say anything? Yeah, about it's it's strange uh, question from Kathy. As I said at the beginning of my um, presentation, you know, we're in this situation because of central government, because of a Tory government putting us in austerity for over 10 years, you know, and we're all, like any other community, is, is feeling the um, the results of that, you know, so that's why we're in this position. But I, I certainly want to see um, this facility um, in, um, in Prenton, and like the residents, uh, this application has been put to, to the people of Prenton, but there's no way this, this facility should be put in Prenton, as I said at the very beginning, unless the uh, residents' concerns are mitigated, unless the planning committee 
can can say in no uncertain terms that these children will not be um, there will not be any safeguarding issues with these children. That the planning committee can turn around and say um, that there'll be no adverse effects on the local community. So yeah, like like any planning committee, like any planning application, uh, the ward councillors um, are are there to represent the people of Prenton, and I will represent the people of Prenton and their views, and I have done today. And if um, their views and their concerns are met by the planning um, committee and the planning officers, then um, we, we'll we'll take that. Okay, thanks, thanks, for that. Kathy. You, you you want to come back, but I I, I suspect that that's the answer. Um, yes, um, chair. Um, first of all, it's a planning committee. I don't think it's a forum for politics about well, uh, austerity. Kathy, no, uh, well, Kathy, no. I, I don't. I don't want to get into an, an argument. Well, well Kathy, it's Kathy, just a Kathy, chair. This is uh, this, this is a planning committee. It's 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 not well, for I'm, I'm to start seat. making party political propaganda. Well, the, we we we've, we've had representations and and we can afford them whichever weight um, uh, we want to. Okay, let's bring in um, Stuart Whittingham now, please. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, it's, it's interesting you've been distributing leaf leaflets during lockdown. I, I must say. Um, so Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask. Stuart, Stuart, no, I just want to ask the class just to come out. Just want to ask the question. Was that, was that a comment to me? Because I haven't. No, it wasn't a comment to you, uh, well, Stuart. It was, um, well, well, let's let's. Uh, the, the ward councillor. Uh, <laughs> okay. We don't, can we I? Know who it was? So can, can, um, I, can I ask the question? Um, so. so Chris, you, you, thanks for your presentation. You, you, you mentioned uh, the risk around ASB uh, and and um, if this application was uh, was passed, uh, and I think you, you quite rightly uh, acknowledged um, the risk assessments that go that that was around um, you know, each resident uh, or, or call clients at the facility. Uh, I just wondered why would you think that the children in the nursery be more at risk? From a homeless person and a care home yeah. residents. Sorry. Just... You all right, Chris? Is this a question to me? Uh, I, I think it was, yes. Oh, I see. Well, well, well uh, I, I wouldn't, personally. I, I don't see quite entirely where that question is coming from. Um, well, it's, it's, it's been asked, and, and I guess you've answered this. You, you wouldn't. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, if, you could, if you could just repeat it, because it was came, it was a little bit obscured. If you could just repeat your question, uh, Councillor Whittingham, again, just to make sure I've got it. Yeah. Because it surprised so, me somewhat that you yeah, interpreted so, what I'd said in that way. So, so in, in your in your presentation, you, you yeah. made notes of uh, the potential of ASB in the in the in the area. Sorry, of the, Antisocial behaviour at the room. Oh, sorry, antisocial behaviour. Yeah. Right. Don't so, like acronyms. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So, so you you did make mention of that uh, during your presentation. Uh, so my question is, uh, you know, given um, the risk assessments that uh, the ARC have already said they're going to put in place, why would you think there'd be a greater risk of antisocial behaviour from a homeless person as opposed to a care home residents? Because that's been a care home for a number of years, hasn't it? Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, OK, yeah. Well, um, it, it is possible. I, I'm not really making comparisons with what's happened uh, in the past. I'm not aware of what you would what used to go on uh, while Abbeyfield House was a care home. Um, I'm just simply projecting to the future, you know, uh, trying to visualise scenarios that could occur and which have been mentioned to me several times by residents, you know. Uh, there could be... A number of individuals in the rear garden who, who could be causing undue noise which might be interfering with the children playing and disturbing them and so on uh, perhaps you know uh, behaving in a way that um, we're a lark under whom they're um, under license to uh, wouldn't approve you know and, and that there may need to be interventions in a situation like that um, that's really what I was saying Okay, thanks for that. Paul Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question, just to expand a little bit on uh, Stuart Whittingham's question, um, with regards to um, 
the safeguarding concerns that um, that you've alluded to, councillor, um, and that your report and that residents have, have raised um, with yourself. I just wondered if you could uh, um, let the, um, the members of the committee know what safeguarding concerns that you have or have been reported to you by residents and how would that differ from previous tenants or if this isn't converted into what will what ARC wants it to, what it may be in the future. Um, so it's specifically around safeguarding because both yourself and um, the care home, uh, sorry, the mm. children's nursery um, owner made mm. uh, made comment about safeguarding mm. with regards to children. So it's specifically mm. what safeguarding mm. concerns. Well, yeah, safeguard. I, I'm quite happy to answer that. Um, uh, I, I don't feel that uh, there would be essential safeguarding issues for the children in terms of the actual physical safety because as, as I pointed out in my presentation the children are very well uh, attended to uh, while on the premises of the nursery whether in the garden or in the building there's a very high staff to um, child ratio as I said uh, you know one to uh, two very little ones one to three three-year-olds and, and one to eight isn't it um, um, uh, for four-year-olds, you know, so I don't believe they would be actually in any danger uh, in, in that situation. Um, but 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 I do feel they could be subject to inappropriate influences potentially if they're in the rear garden. If you know, in the event of um, one of the one of the residents uh, next door, you know, perhaps uh, shouting whatever behaving in an appropriate way that is a that is a potential concern you know because the children spend so much time outside it's not just nipping out for 20 minutes for a break during the daytime you know uh, they spend a lot of the time in the rear garden learning as well as playing so i think that is a concern um okay okay uh, just one more question please chair um you, you made reference to that if this goes ahead there's a possibility that um the nursery itself could close down as a result. Mm. Why do you think well, uh, well, that I think, a nursery mm. or another business would close down as a result of this application being granted? I, I don't personally think it would. I think there's, um, if there is a perception in the neighbourhood generally, and clearly a lot of residents in the area are concerned, uh, including those who send the children to the nursery, um, if there is a perception that perhaps the council will or don't address uh, successfully, uh, that the children, you know, may not be as well safeguarded as in the past, uh, then there's a danger that they will withdraw their children, you know, and take them to another nursery school, basically, and that that could, you know, uh, make the, the, the nursery business unviable. Uh, if it were lost to the community, that would be, a, you know, a diminish the immunity for, 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 the, for the area. That is, that, that, you know, it's, it's something that has to be um, considered, I believe, in... You know, looking ahead uh, and considering whether or not to approve this this application. Thank you, Chair. Mm. You, uh, uh, Paul, and uh, uh, councillors, thank you for your uh, uh, presentations. Okay, open up to members' um, comments or questions to officers. Can, can I ask Matthew just to uh, just to kick it off as as members are typing? Um, uh, that they want to speak. There's this issue of, of shared facilities within the building. I distinctly heard the uh, applicants say that uh, all the flats would be self-contained and there is only uh, limited um, shared areas. But the plans that were put up earlier uh, show the lounge and the uh, existing conservatory uh, almost as communal areas. So I don't know whether... Matthew, you're in a position to comment on on that from the point of view of the plans. Um, can I can I put the plans back up? Yes, please. Are they showing? Yes. Okay. So the plan that you can see at the moment is the um, uh, the existing floor plans. And just up here on the, the existing ground floor, there's a lounge, a kitchen, um, and two conservatories. If I move to the 
um, to the proposed ground floor, the lounge, the conservatories and the kitchen um, are, are still shown on the proposed plans. So um, there is still the potential to use those as, um, as shared communal areas. Um, although the applicant has indicated, and, and you can clearly see from the plan, that each of the units is self-contained with its own bathroom, its kitchenette, um, and a, an area for a bed, a chair, desk, TV. Um, so, but but those those uh, those areas are still clearly indicated on the proposed ground floor plan. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, open to ask the committee, please. Sam. Hi, thank you for that, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, but before I start, I just um, would really like to thank um, everybody who's spoken for their contributions, um, contributions from uh, residents and applications and also from the councillors, um, recognising that given the, the number of residents who've wanted to speak about this, then there's obviously a level of contention towards this application. Um, and it has, I think, um, that, that we've had a lot of passionate um, conversations. I know everybody's heard an awful lot of passionate um, for and against arguments from residents. Um, I guess in terms of what we've heard from the petitioner and what we've heard from the councillors and what we will have heard, <clears throat> excuse me, from comments through email and through phone calls with residents. Um, as I see it, the, the concerns sort of bucketed into four areas. Um, and uh, for me, I think the first area that we heard an awful lot of commentary around was antisocial behaviour. Um, what, what I was really pleased to hear um, from Mr Jamal was around the light touch um, element of staffing requirements, given the nature of the potential residents of this facility. Um, I, I think how, how I've seen it described by him is that there are high touch areas, there are medium touch and there are lighter touch. And from his description of the potential facility in Prenton being lighter touch, um, I hope, uh, and from my perspective, I think that that went some way to help alleviate potential concerns on antisocial behaviour. The second area was around criminal checks. Um, I know an awful lot of residents, as I mentioned earlier, were particularly concerned on this term of on licence. Um, and so I guess we've, we've got the understanding that perhaps uh, that was a misunderstanding of what on licence meant. Um, but surrounding the checks that um, that were mentioned by the representative from the ARC of um, no drug taking, no daily alcohol drinking um, and no criminal records, um, RE children, um, then hopefully that will give some concern and that gave me some concern too. Um, I think there was definitely uh, some commentary from residents around the amount of engagement that had or hadn't been done by the community. Um, what, what I guess we've heard is that there has been the appropriate engagements from planning committee and there have been some engagements from Wirral's ARC. My ask as always, um, I, I think many people on planning committee have, have asked this, when there is, um, whether it's a significant size in development or something that might be contentious in this way, my ask is always um, to any applicants to engage as much as possible. I think what we heard from most residents, um, as um, you know, as we heard from Mr. Williams, was there's a huge amount of support for what rural arc do, particularly in Prenton um, and and across the world. People do just want to be engaged um, early on and as and, and in as much detail as possible. Um, and then I think the final area that I heard a lot from residents was about this being a halfway house, a shelter. A lot of people use the term hostel, um, but I think we heard we heard earlier as well that it, it, it absolutely isn't a hostel. It is, um, you know, somewhere between six and 12 months for people who are looking to uh, be at their final journey towards uh, being away from homelessness and to being on their feet. Um, so um, I think through the conversation, I'm, I'm still interested to hear what my fellow councillors on the on the committee have to say. Um, but from my perspective, I think this uses a brand brownfield site. We've had really good and significant assurances uh, from the proposed developers of, of how they would integrate in the community and how they would look after the neighbourhood residents as well as their own residents. Um, it's residential use turning into residential use. So as far as I can see yet, um, and, and as it currently stands, I am minded to support this application. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, who do we have? Uh, Steve Fox. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to everyone who's contributed. I think it's been an excellent debate. I think we've um, got rid of a few myths and tales that have been going around the application um, about what license is. And uh, if anything, the reference to license 
is actually the most positive thing I've heard because um, the people on this uh, or in this scheme will have that sort of um, in the back of their mind that if they don't sort of become good neighbours or don't conform to uh, normal um, activity and normal behaviours, then ultimately they could go back down. Uh, and my, my overall view of this is that any one of us, any one of us could fall off of the ladder of life, if you like, and then you fall off the ladder and you start to get back on the ladder. And it appears to me, uh, with all the reassurance that we've had, that the people who will be using this accommodation are the people quite high up the ladder, ready to move on uh, and 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 uh, make that thing. So we just need to bear in mind that any one of us through any number of circumstances, through health, through uh, work, through unemployment, through all those issues could be uh, people who, who fall off that ladder. I accept all the apprehensions and the rumour mill will have gone around that area and accept all the apprehensions and there was talk of a leaflet, I don't know what was said or done in the leaflet to help or, or not. However, at, the, the thing people need to understand is at its simplest, this application is a planning application about the conversion of a property through a residential use in a primarily residential area. One could argue that the non-residential use next door to it is is the is the, the nursery is is the bit out of kilter. Very successful, and I'm sure it will remain to be successful. Where where we've been asked to stray into as a committee is assurances about safeguarding, about general overall health and safety policy, and also issues that are quite a little bit out of the remit. And what I always think happens at planning committee is. Because it's the place where the first step is taken, which is the trigger, no planning application, this thing doesn't happen, there's no need for any further debate or discussion. The, the actual trigger to start the process of consultation and reassurance becomes the focal for that reassurance, if you understand what I mean. So in pure planning terms, we have to look at it. It, it, it is accommodation that would be suitable, 15 self-contained flats, for any particular clientele. I understand the apprehensions around what people believe the clientele to be and what that might be. And the other issues uh, that, that come in are things that will be discussed and dealt with. And one of the, the reassurances I have is that we're dealing with a long established uh, organization on, on, on the Whittle that is dealing with the Whittle that is used to, to carrying out this work and they will be able to engage in the future. Uh, I'm not sure as the debate goes on, whether we're going to be asked to put unreasonable conditions such as 24 hour surveillance or what, whatever. But I think the reassurance we have is that the the, the, the individuals are of such um, a clientele base that they have everything to invest in making, making good of the opportunity they're given. And that's the best we can do. Uh, we cannot continue to say to people moving up the homeless ladder, well, you should be sh stuck away somewhere in an industrial estate or stuck away, uh, you know, where there's no residence. That's not what we're saying to these people. We're saying you are now becoming residents and moving on. So I think there's a great deal uh, of merit in the application. Uh, there is, a, I believe, a condition about the fence. You quote, you asked a question, Chair, did you not, about the lounge area? Uh, and both sort of laugh at each other. Some people are saying it shouldn't have a lounge area because that, for whatever reason, and others are people saying that people will congregate in the back of the property uh, and, you know, potentially swear or 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 make um, life intolerable for the the, the nursery. Um, most schools have fences and uh, gates and things opening onto the public highway. We we as a planning committee can't assure that anyone under the planning condition that no one will ever swear. But what we can do is is take a balanced view in the planning terms. And then when it moves forward, the people who are going to operate it and everyone involved gets together and works together. So in terms, and I'm looking at it very purely as our position as a planning committee, it is a use that is suitable for a residential area. Um, and I would need to look at any conditions that are put on, that they be deemed reasonable and any reasons for refusal, uh, if they are to be moved tonight, would be have to be uh, defendable and on planning terms. 
So that, that's my sort of fix on it. But I'm happy to listen. I'll remain open-minded until the end of the debate. But I think it's been a fairly good debate, and I think it's been fairly positive in, in the way we have now know what this establishment is going to be. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, Alan Gray. Thank you, Chair. It's quite helpful following on from uh, Steve's comments. Um, uh, as most members know, I'm, I'm a deputy on this committee and I'm not really used to uh, judging planning matters. Uh, and I'd really like to seek uh, a little bit of guidance here. Uh, it seems to me that almost all the discussion over the last hour and a half has been about the, the character of the potential uh, residents uh, in this property. Uh, and uh, as far as I understand it, this is actually not a, a, a germane planning issue. Um, I'd, I'd really just like some clarification on that because as far as I can see, as, as Steve was just saying, the property itself looks perfectly suitable for the uh, intended use. Matthew, do you want to yeah, OK, so um, generally speaking, the, the planning regulations and planning law um, is quite clear that um, the decision maker for, for planning decisions should not concern itself with, with occupancy of, um, of, uh, of planning proposals. Um, we, you know, we, we can't control occupancy, we can't put conditions on that say particular people should live in particular areas. Um, so, so to answer Councillor Brame's question, um, it, the, uh, the occupancy of a building, um, a residential building, is is not really a material planning consideration. Thank you, um, Brian Kelly. Sorry, I'll, I'll, Brian Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. It, it minds a, a question, Chair. Mr. Williams, and I think also Councillor Norbury, made reference to the fact that the application had not been passed to Children's Services for comment. My question is, perhaps to Matthew, is should it have been passed to Children's Services for comment? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Through, through you, Chair. Um, no, children's services uh, weren't consulted on this application, and there was no need to consult children's services because this isn't a, this isn't an application um, that is dealing with uh, with children. Uh, the nursery were consulted, and as we've heard, the nursery have had the opportunity to put forward their objections, so there was no need to consult with um, uh, with children's services, and and the safeguarding issues around that which you which committee have heard tonight that that's really an issue for um the uh, the, the the people who will be operating the site it, it's not it's not a planning issue okay thanks for that and kathy yeah uh, just a couple of comments. First of all, I agree absolutely entirely with everything that Steve Fawkes has just said and Alan Brame. Um, I thought we were straying right out of planning territory. Um, uh, um, Steve, when he said that, you know, we're demonising people who are homeless, and I agree with him that, you know, there for the grace of God go any of us. But also, I, I used to work in the north end of Birkenhead in Old Bidston Road, and the Grand Trunk, which is why I asked the question, was on the end and um, was 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 occupied obviously by the ark and i have to say i never ever heard of any problems with the with the grand trunk when it was occupied um by the ark um there were a couple of terrace houses further down i don't think any of the residents there had any problems i used to see people outside on their bikes didn't even know who was living there really um so from my own perspective i think it's wrong as matthew was well matthew didn't say it was wrong but it is a planning application. It's not about who lives in it. Because we've, we can all put different value judgments on things. In terms of the application, I'm quite happy to support it. Um, I would be happy to support it as it stands and not with any other conditions being attached, which I don't think are planning conditions. I don't think it'd be enforceable and I don't think they're warranted. Um, and, um, and, I, and I hope that the nursery succeeds 
as it has at the moment. And I hope that the residents that occupy the building next door um, go on to lead successful and fulfilled and happy lives. And I hope if we can help them in that uh, context, context then, then all the better. Thanks, Cathy. And Stuart Whittingham. Stuart Whittingham. Sorry, I didn't unmute. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> yeah, um, th thanks, Chair. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for the, the, the really excellent uh, debate tonight. Uh, really, I'd like to echo really echo what you know, Steve Fawkes and uh, Kathy Austin just said uh, in terms of, you know, we, we, can't, we can't put everyone um, in the, in the uh, stereotype, everyone under, under the same label. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of homelessness, the, the people we see, you no know, sleeping rough or uh, you no know, street drinkers, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, you, you, you're talking, talking about you know, people who are safe so food, who are staying with friends, um, you know, who live care lives. The, the, this accommodation is not for that cohort of people who are, the, the, you, know, you, you see, you know, sleeping on the streets um, or, or, or street drinking. No, this, this is... You know, to give extra support to you know, people who need that extra step up, uh, you know, to secure a, you know, a more sustainable tenancy and, and they'll get help with budgeting and and, and what have you. Uh, so, you know, as of today, um, there's been 200 placements, homeless placements uh, by local authority, obviously in part response to the, the COVID crisis. Um, and obviously this, this is a service that will be in great demand. Um, as I see, read the report, I, I can't see any planning reason why this, this uh, application shouldn't pass, though I do appreciate that people will be concerned uh, and there will be apprehensions and there will be, um, y y y y you know, no fears and what have you. And that I, I'm hoping that the questions and the debates have given reassurance to residents and also the, the, the nursery next door. Um, I sincerely hope, and I do believe that in time, both the nursery and uh, Abbey Field will become very good neighbours and very good friends. Um, so, no, I, when the time comes, I would have no trouble, uh, no support in this application. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, I'm Mary Jordan. Mary? Yeah. Uh, yep. It just takes ages for that to, the little line to go off. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment, Chair. Well, a couple of comments, actually. Uh, I used to volunteer at Mary Cole House some years ago, uh, and there were a number of clients then who had cars. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the residents of this property could have cars. And I do think the officers have made an assumption that perhaps can't be seen through. Um, the other thing that I, I'd like to say is that I know it's not a material consideration for planning, but I am very disturbed. Hmm? Can you turn the camera on, please, Mary? On. On. Is it on? It's, it's you, on. Your camera. Yeah, it is on. Okay. There it is. Now it's off now. Okay. It just takes it. Okay, there. Can there you see you, me now? We can, and this is what we wanted. Right, that's that's fine. I, I'm just I'm concerned that children's services aren't involved. I, and I know that's not a material planning consideration, uh, but I do think it would have been better if they had. Uh, and then it would have given some sort of uh, assurance to parents of children who are likely to be going to the nursery in the future that everything was going to be okay. Thanks for that, um, Mary. Uh, Steve Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I believe many of the um, woodies from residents and the care home were probably possibly due to some misconceptions because of the word licensing and other issues. But I feel we've had a lot of information 
out given to us tonight, and I, 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 I'm, I'm satisfied that um, that most of them woodies, even if they weren't material considerations, have been addressed. So I'm minded to support the application. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, Ian? Ian Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Can I be seen and heard? Yes. Um, you... Yes, thank you very much. Um, like uh, many members, I think this is probably one of the best uh, items that I've heard debated and discussed at a ploughing committee because I think we have heard from both sides, uh, both Mr Williams and I thank Mr Williams for the time that he's taken to put forward very clear and very consistent points of view and raise legitimate concerns that he has and also to hear from Mr Jamal from uh, from the ARC. Um, like Mary Jordan, um, I knew Mary Cole uh, many years ago, I met her when I first got involved in local issues in New Brighton uh, more than well, about 30 years ago. And she would be very proud, I think, today if she could see what um, the ARC is achieving and is helping a number of people to get back on their feet. Um, certainly as a planning committee, we have been, well, many of us, not all of us, sadly, but many of us have been fairly, fairly robust in opposing uh, applications for HMOs, uh, which we felt did not cater to the needs of some of the most vulnerable people, where some of the um, controls that Mr Jamal has outlined to us are not in place in some HMOs that we've sadly seen approved recently in the borough. Uh, so I think this is a very positive step in terms of what the ARC is trying to do to help more people get back on their feet uh, into sustainable and uh, respectable accommodation rather than being uh, catered for by, well, as we've said in previous debates, slum landlords uh, in some, some of the HMOs that we've approved. Uh, I would hope that some of the views that the committee has heard tonight will influence the way that we're going to vote. Certainly the information that Mr Jamal has given um, in terms of who is going to be catered for, who is going to be living in this property if it's approved, uh, would I hope uh, put to bed some of the concerns of some of the neighbours. Uh, I'm clearly I have the debate isn't over yet, but I, I look forward to hearing what the members have to say before we go to a vote. Chair, yeah, but thank everybody, um, the ward councillors, the petitioner, the applicant, and other members of the committee for the points that they've taken uh, the time to submit. And I do think this has been one of the best committee uh, discussions that we've had for a long time. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, and Irene Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just want to make a few points. Um, I, I quite agree with Mary that I feel a bit uneasy that the children's services haven't been involved, although I know that's not a planning issue. Um, I was, um, I'm glad that um, the people that are coming into the unit are, would be, you know, would be a light touch. There would, would be people that are, are 90, that, that would and are nearly uh, at the point where they 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 can live independent and they just need help with budgets and maybe getting a job. Um, the overlooking issue that would be addressed mostly by the two foot walls that's going to be put up. Um, Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's all, yeah. Thanks, Irene. And uh, Bruce Berry. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree with um, <clears throat> what's been said already. That's a um, fantastic debate that's uh, taken place tonight. Um, I must say I was very, very concerned when I first read the documentation about this. Um, having listened to Mr. J uh, Jamal, I think that um, he's cleared up a lot of points. The the point for me that that was um, most pivotal in all of this was the issue of the licence. And uh, once Mr. Jamal cleared up that issue for me, um, and once he clarified the um, the, the the people that they intend to put within this facility and uh, the fact that they are very, very low level and they are ready to move on does give me a great deal of reassurance. Uh, I, I, am, I do have concerns about the nursery even now. <clears throat> I'm 
maybe it's it's unfounded, but there could well be a perception um, from parents of the children that this could be a risk. But um, I think anybody that was listening to this debate tonight would take comfort from the fact that we've explored it considerably. And I think that we've, we've done a good job. And um, I'm certainly relieved to hear what I've heard tonight from all parties. Thank you. And Sam Frost, you want to come back to us? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's not my intention to interject if people already, if people haven't yet had chance to um, to speak on this. Uh, but if there isn't any more, then um, I'd be keen to move for approval. Okay. We'll take that. Could, could could I please come in, George? Um, it's it's the only reason I'm saying it. The chat isn't working on the on the machine at all. Okay, so I've been sitting there very. Pleasant listening to the uh, to the whole thing going through, and like um, Ian Lewis said before, many many years um, we've sat on planning for a long long time, and probably that's one of the best debates that I've seen, because it started out if you like with Mr Williams putting forward um, eight eight reasons why um, he he had fears and worries and concerns, and and the way Mr Jamel handled that when he came back and answer those questions. And then the questions that we've asked pertinently to the, to the officers and also to um, everyone else, in some ways, um, it's, it's changed the whole thing right round. And, and in my opinion, um, I think that's the way we should always be like this. It's absolutely perfect. It's taken two hours to get to where we are, but questions have been answered. In some ways, some people might turn around and say, why weren't the answered before? Okay, they weren't answered before, they've been answered now, and I've got no hesitation now whatsoever in this moving forward with it. Thank you. Thanks for that, George. Um, okay, we, we, we've had a motion, I'll bring Stuart Whittingham in in a, uh, in a moment. Um, he's indicated he wishes to second, I'm comfortable with that. Um, uh, I'm glad we've, we, we have been able to uh, have this debate. Um, there are, as has been suggested, two two issues um, before us. One is the strict letter of the planning uh, law, uh, and if we strip it back to that, then we're dealing with a change of use from use class C2 to use class C3, C2 being um, an institution like an elderly person's home, uh, which the building was and, and is now not fit for purpose um, in, in that or not in that use, to C3, which is residential, um, straightforward residential in a residential uh, area. The extra detail we have is effectively the, the end user. Um, there's no reason why we've had the end user. They've, they've, they've said what it's, it's going to be. It was quite possible for uh, an application to come before us for a C2 to C3 uh, change and then for uh, for that to be put in by the owner of the building um, and then for Ark just to come along and take the tenancy uh, off, the, uh, off the owner uh, of the building without any further requirement for uh, planning permission. And that's where we, that's effectively in planning terms, where we're at, I think Steve Fox made uh, made that point. Um, a couple of other planning issues were put before us in terms of uh, car parking spaces and amenity space. Um, we have had residential uh, applications before us uh, in the past where uh, amenity space has not quite met the requirements of, of policy, and we've certainly had uh, applications before us where car parking um, has been an adequate and we've refused those and we've not been successful uh, when the matter's gone uh, to appeal. We don't, I personally don't feel we have grounds to refuse uh, the application on, on those grounds uh, at all. Um, a move from C2 to C3 in a residential area is is plainly um, within, the, um, uh, within the spirit of, of planning legislation. Uh, as for the end use, um, I do agree with members that have said that, um, you know, residents will have been concerned uh, uh, about the uh, uh, the end use. How are people selected? Who are they? Um, and Mr Jamal was able to uh, to assure us in terms of the uh, the risk assessment process. And Will Ark, 
um, are aware of who their neighbours are. It is a nursery, and, and to that extent, it will be a good neighbour um, to their um, uh, to their proposed uh, use. And it would not certainly not, I don't think, be in the arc's interest um, for the nursery to to leave and for that building then to become um, uh, residential in 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 nature. Um, so. Um, that being said, I have Sam Frost who has uh, who has who has moved. I'll bring in Stuart Whittingham, who's indicated. Stuart. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. And uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone for the contributions. It's been a fantastic debate. Um, now, we're very happy to to second the proposals, move the recommendations, uh, with the conditions attached. Okay. In which case, there's been a full enough debate. We can move to. The vote if members can prepare to vote. Um, voting will be for, against, or abstention uh, or abstaining on the motion. The solicitor will call your name. Please turn on your camera and your microphone. Say who you are before you vote. Make sure your uh, picture is in the um, uh, on the screen uh, before you vote. Members should only cast a vote if they have heard the planning officer's presentation and the debate in relation to this matter in full and have not had any technical difficulties during the item. In the event that you have had problems here in the discussion, you should not vote and indicate not voting when called. Okay, so I'll hand us over to the uh, uh, solicitor to carry out the vote. Thank you, Councillor uh, Kelly. Um, can I call it Councillor Bruce Berry? <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Bruce Berry. Uh, I'm voting in favour. Thank you. Councillor Bame? Uh, Councillor Alan Brame, four. Thank you. Councillor Davis? Councillor George Davis, uh, just to, to indicate to the solicitor that I had a, a, an altercation with my chat around about for about three minutes and it came back on. It was OK. Uh, if I was going to vote, I don't know whether I'm entitled to vote on that. Yeah. Did you, did you hear all of I the I heard it things? all, yeah. I could hear, but I, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't get onto the chat. Yeah. Um, so, you, so, yes. You were able to hear the debate. I am voting in favour. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Fox. Yes, thank you. Um, I will be voting in favour and I've heard the full debate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Frost. Hi, Councillor Sam Frost. I've heard the whole debate and I'll be voting for. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Councillor Steve Hayes. I've heard the full vote. Uh, I've heard the full debate, and I'll be voting for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hodson. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Catherine Hodson. I've heard the full debate, and I'm voting for. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Chair. I've heard the full debate. Mary, Councillor Mary Jordan, and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Yes, uh, Councillor Kelly, I've heard the debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. Yes, thank you, Councillor Brian Kenny. I've heard the full debate and I'm voting in favour. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ian Lewis. I've heard and taken part in the full debate and I'm voting in favour. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, Paul Stewart. Um, thank you, yeah, Councillor Paul Stewart. I've had the full debate and I'm voting in favour. Thank you. Councillor Whittingham. Yes, Councillor Stuart Whittingham. Um, had the full debate, I'll be voting in favour. 
Thank you. And Councillor Williams. I've heard the full debate and I'm voting in favour. Thank you. That's um, a 14 votes for, which is unanimous. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so for the benefit of people watching, people attending, um, that application has been uh, approved. Uh, members, I, I've had a request from a member for a comfort break. Um, I don't want it to last too long, but um, can, can we say 10 past 8? Can we be back at 10 past 8, please? Yeah. Yeah. Thank thanks. you. Okay, Chair, I've yeah. just restarted. Okay, thanks. So, okay, so we'll resume the uh, meeting. I'll just uh, call the roll again so that we know that everybody is in place. Uh, Bruce Berry? Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yes, I'm here. I'm back. Okay, excellent. Um, Alan Brown? Yes, I'm here. George Davis? Yes, I'm here. Steve Fawkes. Yes, sir. Samantha Frost. Yep, Chair. Uh, Steve Hayes. Yes, Chair. Kathy Hodson. Yes, Chair, I'm here. Excellent. Mary Jordan. Yes, I'm here. Brian Kelly. Present, sir. Uh, Ian Lewis. Present. Excellent. Paul Stewart. Present. Uh, Stuart Whittingham. I'm here. Just do that again, Stuart. We couldn't quite hear that. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Irene Williams. Yes, I'm here. Excellent, thank you. So we're moving to um, agenda item five, uh, which is Mel's Railway Station, uh, Birkenhead Road. If we can ask the plan officer to introduce their report, please. help if I had the microphone turned on. <laughs> um, so planning permission is sought for the demolition of, wrong one, wrong Mel's. One of the other Mel's, Matthew. <laughs> yeah. So um, can I just confirm that that plan is showing on the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So permission is sought for the retention of a 1.8 metres high galvanised palisade fence that runs for 112 metres along Birkenhead Road by Mel's railway station. Uh, the red edged line on the plan on the screen is the extent of the fence. And the photos that you can see um, across the top of the screen um, indicate, uh, well, show, show what the fence looks like because the fence has already been erected and therefore this is a retrospective planning application. The fence replaces a concrete post and metal mesh fence, which was in a very poor state of repair and did little and did little to enhance the character and posed a danger to the public. Um, a condition is proposed that would secure a landscaping scheme which would comprise of native tree and hedgerow species. And this is considered uh, will successfully soften the appearance of the new fence in the street scene. Given the existence of a, pre of a fence previously and with the addition of the landscaping secured by condition, it is considered that the fence does not harm the character of the street scene and the application is recommended for approval. Uh, there is no petition of objection in association with this application. Okay, thanks for that. It's before us by member referral. I'm going to ask Alison Wright. 
Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Hello. So we can. can you hear? Yep. You can hear me. Yeah. Yes. We can hear and see. Okay. Um, Alison Wright, Councillor for Hoylake and Mells Ward. I wish to speak in support of residents who are against the retention of this 112 metre long fence here at the, close to the railway station on the Birkenhead Road. The structure is industrial in design, constructed from shiny galvanised metal with spiky features and angular lines and is harsh, and it was described one, res one resident as menacing. It is extensive and uniform, so alongside all the features mentioned, makes it not in keeping with... Um, Alison, you, you seem to have muted yourself. Is that it? Have You're you got back. it? Yes. Should I go back again? Um, Should I repeat? You, you were just saying about the residents. Ah, uh, the residents are against the retention of this, this fence. It's the structure is in, industrial in design, constructed from shiny galvanized metal with spiky features and angular, angular right, lines and is of really harsh appearance. It is extensive and uniform, so along with all these featured mentions, it makes it not in keeping with the semi-rural character of the area. The structure is on a designated green belt area, bordering a fishing pond, so the site has an open aspect. The new fence is a replacement for an open mesh design structure, as the officer has described. This was in a poor condition, and it probably was in need of replacement. But I will say, and it has been mentioned by residents, that the original offered a level of security that was appropriate whilst, whilst overhaul, overall helping to complement and maintain the open aspect by the nature of its design. The new structure may offer a high level of security, but it takes away the character of the green belt area in terms of of the design features, which also stretches, has a strong sense of enclosure that is inappropriate and unnecessary on this site. The new fence has a negative impact on the visual amenity, so important to residents and others, in the, is a highly visual site being very close to the main Birkenhead Road there into Mells and Hoylake. It takes away, as was described to me, the view of the pond, this open aspect across the pond and the fields beyond, which is so important to local residents who also live, as I might say, close to this very busy road. Along, uh, also along there, there's a range of different fencing close to the mill station, but they don't present a significant impact on the character of the designated green belt, unlike the new structure. I have to point out, as, it, as uh, you know, planning permission was not sought prior to the construction of this fence on site. It was brought to the attention of the authority, I understand, by a resident who brought the issue to us and attention was drawn to it, to enforcement, and so planning permission was necessary here. So really, this fence didn't go due, through the due process of investigation by the authority and also consideration by local people. As a designated belt area, the application was was considered by the authority now, and it needed to be against the Wirral UDP and the N, uh, the National Policy Framework Policy Framework. Part 12 indicates that the planning decisions are of that national framework. Uh, that, that due consideration to um, developments that are visually attractive involving architecture and landscaping. And indeed, paragraph 143 of that framework indicates that when the green area is defined, 
the local authority is required to enhance and retain landscapes, visual amenity, visual amenity and biodiversity. And it's been outlined in the notes and has been mentioned, the fence is a replacement that forms the boundary of the fishing club site. It's therefore a leisure facility and it is outdoor recreation that essentially preserves the openness of the site so important to the character of this site. However, as previously outlined in the terms of the particular features of this specific fence, it has a negative impact on the character. And this is, is a very important site. It doesn't enhance or retain the landscape, therefore having a detrimental impact on the visual immunity, creating a distinct high level of enclosure this is largely due to the harsh, uniform design of the structure, including the extent and the marginally higher level of this fence. And it con contributes to a negative and um, a sense, it, sort of insensitive feeling of enclosure, as I said before. It's been mentioned in the notes also that there's a willingness to introduce planting along the inner face of the structure. And the, on the officer mentioned this as well. This is considered to soften the harsh lines of the, French, the fence. And the structure, I believe, and we believe, would be difficult to, to disguise, owing to the very, as the pictures show, a very strong angular design. Also, if foliage, if foliage is to grow through the gaps in the fence to soften the lines, as was suggested, it may, I feel that it may be necessary to have curf a careful maintenance program since narrowing in any way of, um, of, of, of the pavement area that borders the entire length of the fence should not be obstructed. This walkway is access, a very important access to the station entrance and also allows residents to reach the shops in Mells. If I may suggest on the first point, the appropriate alternative fence here uh, should be uh, taking con due consideration to this very important uh, site, sensitive to the green open land, in order to protect, enhance and, and maintain that green space. The character, the visual amenity of this space can be in balance and should be endeavoured to reach an appropriate fence that is sensitive to all that and reach an appropriate level of security here. Um, and I think something in the terms of an eco-friendly structure of some kind. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Brian Kelly, you've got a question. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Through you, um, Councillor Wright referred to the harsh appearance of the fence as it stands now. But I would like to ask her, does she not accept that the fact that Mersey Rail have already agreed to a condition which will mean that planting will take place on the inner side of the new fence, i.e. there will be landscaping, does she not accept that that in itself, perhaps not immediately, but certainly over time would mean that the overall appearance of the fence would improve. Thank you, Chair. I did look at that, but I do think, as I said in the presentation, that this particular fence is so uniform and it's so extensive of 112 metres, it would be difficult to achieve that. I also think that it, there is no room for any obstruction if plants were to go through because you would need to soften that particular structure. You would need plants to grow through the gaps in the fence. And I do think that this would not necessarily be very successful and careful maintenance would have to be given to that particular pathway. As I say, it is a very busy pathway and a very busy road. It's a main access to the station and also to the shopping, the, the main shopping centre in Mells. So it is well used and would have to be kept very, very clear of, of foliage. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. OK, we'll uh, open the matter for debate. Any members want to make a contribution? Well, like Bruce Berry, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I actually um, drove past this fence today and had a good look at it. Um, there, there are aspects of it that, that um, you know, they're quite acceptable, but I can see where the residents are coming from um, because of the, the open aspect that was there before. And it, it is a nice outlook, or should I say it was a nice outlook um, with the old fencing position. But what, um, what concerns me on the, um, the softening idea of the plantation uh, behind the fence is that because it's a very close coupled fence, there's not a lot of distance between each, um, each section. So therefore, um, once the planting took place and it would have to be established over a, quite a period of time, um, I don't know how much of the planting you would actually see because it's quite quite a close knit fence from what I what I saw today. So um, could we have a view on that possibly um, as to whether um, what what benefits at all the the, um, the planting would achieve? Thank you. Matthew, did you want to? Comments of through your massive opinion, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, through you, Chair, uh, the, the, the fence is relatively new, um, and so the, the the sort of galvanized steel is is still quite is still quite um, shiny, and therefore um, it's quite stark in the street scene. Um, but over time, that that shininess um, will will become um, duller. I, I'm just going to put the um, the plan back up again. Um, so, um, on this picture here, you, you can see the fence, and there's al already some some foliage through the existing trees that are starting to grow through the um, um, through the uh, the palisade fencing. So, um, with with the additional landscaping that that's in there, uh, that's proposed, um, you know, it, it will grow through the palisade fence, and it and it will have a a um, a, a softening impact. Okay. Thanks for that. Can we bring in now that Steve folks? Uh, yes. Yes, chair. I took uh, Boris's advice and uh, drove there and done, had an exercise walk while I was out today. Um, okay, um, just to describe um, the fence and people people have seen pictures of it. Um, when you start the journey from where the entrance to the angling club is, there's quite a, an industrial looking gate with spikes on the top uh, and some signs saying private angling club. And then the full length of that is a uniform but neat fence and then we get a mixture of fencing past that as we approach the station and beyond on the other side of the road there is some pretty rough fencing um, and some uh, decent stuff so there's a mixture and types of of, of fencing around the area some well maintained some uh, visibly maintained um I, I would have to say I'm, i would like it you know it's not a plan of an issue but it should be put on record uh, Sorry, for a pub, I'll place, I'll start again. For a public facing company like Mersey Rail, not to have the nous to go through the proper procedures is quite astounding because Mel Station is is a well kept station, part of the community. I know it, it, it's well looked after. And for that organization not to have the, the, the wherewithal to go through the proper uh it, you know, does doesn't bode well for, for, for that organization. So I need to say that in passing. However, um, most of the view 
uh, across the uh, from walking level, most of the view is already obscured by trees and quite mature shrubbery. So in effect, the open aspect is already nature has sort of seen to that. It is visible by walking through the fence. So it's not that close gauge when you're on foot, you can see the open aspect. And when you're driving at the speed limit, you can still actually get the effect of the lake being open and, and seeing across. So I'm guessing, Chair, you know, given its location, and it is quite a pretty area, that it is very much a case of beauty being in the eye of the beholder on this application. Um, my view is that it is far better than what was there. It's uniform. And I do believe, uh, having read some later correspondence today, that the main reason for it was um, criminal activity in and around the station area and uh, certainly the angling club and the sort of little premises they have there was quite badly affected. So, so the fence has to be within health and safety limits high enough and safe enough to deter people without encouraging people to climb it and get injured. So we are in, in that sort of sort of dilemma area. So it really is uh, a, a very fine judgment call, I, I would say, in terms of what people believe to be aesthetically pleasing. It will fade with time and shrubbery will, will overtake that area. But I, I'll just put those comments on a sort of mini site visit chair for, for committee to, to take in and absorb. Thanks for that, uh, Steve. Steve Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, I, I've gone past there many times, to be honest, and uh, I'll be honest with you. I mean, although the view is obscured by shrubbery in parts or many parts, you could clearly see the lake and it was a nice sort of visual impact. And I'll be honest with you, I never even noticed there was a fence there in the past even though I have seen pictures of the state that it got to on Google Maps and you could see it obviously needed replacing. But this current fence, uh, you know, to me, there is a significant difference in visual impact. And I think it does spoil what to me was what looked like quite a nice vaccine, you know. So I am a bit concerned about the um, current um, Palatine fence, fence as it stands because it does look, to me to be far uglier in terms of the visual impact than what was there before, which to be honest, going past in a car as a trap passenger or a driver, I never really noticed the old fence. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Steve. We bring in uh, the other patient, Stuart Whittingham. Th th thanks, Chair. Um, I just find it a bit bizarre. Now, we had a really good uh, debate around uh, facility for homeless people earlier this evening and now we're debating the fence <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit bizarre um so just a, a few comments so so in terms of material the the the, the old chain link fence uh, which obviously has seen better days um was attached was uh, it's itself uh, made from gal galvanized, galvanized steel uh, and attached to industrial and concrete posts um, at varying uh, angles uh, obviously you know due to the long time they've been in place um the material will fade and um, there are lots of um you know near, near where i live there's, there's lots of um, you know galvanized steel uh ballastrail fences and and they, and they do fade into the fade into, you know, into the shrubbery and they do fade and they're not as noticeable so it's, it's only shiny when it's new all, all our all our new lamp posts are all galvanized and obviously they will fade over over, over time um I, I i just think you no know, um, no, you know it'll be a lot less noticeable um, in a couple of months' time after it's fit, after it's weathered, weathered the best. Um, yeah. Okay. That's yours, um, Kathy. Uh, just a couple of questions. One, one to Matthew. Really, um, if the application for a fence had had come in through the normal channels, um, the chances are then that residents would have been notified by the planning department and dialogue could have taken place with um, residents and ward councillors um, to to look at what would be the most appropriate type of fencing to have in the area, especially if it's in the green belt. Um, and so that's that's one thing. Also, um, Steve Hayes mentions that he didn't notice the fence beforehand. And, and that's really the point, isn't it? That a fence that's going to be put up in the green belt, you would expect that it would just blend into the background and you wouldn't really notice it. Although Stuart says that it will fade, uh, it, at the end of the day, it's still going to be galvanised steel and you can't get away from that. 
And Councillor Wright, I think, made an appropriate comment that if you have shrubbery, which is on the other side of the fence, there probably won't be an awful lot of space for shrubbery to grow through the, the gaps. And if they do grow through and they're sticking out and then they start poking people in the eye or whatever as they're walking along the path and it would have to be maintained and cut back and then of course if it's cut back and you can't see it all you will see is the galvanized steel um but matthew um do you think on balance that if the application had come in through the normal channels and i, I take steve Fox's point that you know really mercy rail should have put an application in that's a bit naughty of them um but if the application had come in in the normal channels would it be likely that that this would um, have been approved as it's down now. I mean, it's almost a fait accompli now. Um, and so I'm wondering whether or not the, a, a different weight would have been put um, on this if it had come in through normal channels and not as a retrospective application. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, obviously, this is a retrospective application, so we, we've had to take a view as to whether or not if this had come forward as a as a, a planning application through the normal channels whether or not we would have been likely to recommend approval um, or whether it it would have been um, something that we would not have um, wanted to see in which case um, we we would have uh, refused th th that that application so on, on that basis, if it's something that we would have refused, then we wouldn't have brought this report to you seeking its retention. We would have moved um, straight to enforcement and sought the removal of the fence. So in answer to the question, if this had come through as a normal planning application, uh, not retrospectively, um, our view is that we would still have recommended approval of it. OK, thanks for, for that. Uh, Ian, Lewis? Thank you, Chair. Can I be heard and seen? Is everything working? Yes, got you. Yeah. Uh, Chair, can I thank uh, Councillor Alison Wright uh, for her remarks and for bringing the concerns of her residents to the committee's attention tonight? Uh, I don't actually find anything bizarre in her behaviour in doing that. And I think it's a credit to her that she is. Um, like Councillor Wright, I know the area quite well. I grew up there, as did Councillor Leslie Rennie. Uh, and we know the station and we know the uh, the amenity space that uh, surrounds the station, both in terms of the angling club and the fields that were once there. Um, I do agree with Steve Fox. I do think it's regrettable that uh, Mersey Rail, uh, for whatever reason, did not apply for planning permission for this fence. Um, I would contrast what they've done here with what they did at the uh, Wallasey Grove Road station, where we complained about this, the state of a dilapidated fence. And after some months, they installed a very... Um, easy on the eye kind of fence, uh, one that served the purpose of uh, pedestrian safety um, and the station security, but also was visually um, unobtrusive to the people living opposite. I see no reason why they couldn't have done the same here with a bit more thought. Um, indeed, I, I suspect this has been done as a bit of a rush job uh, because of the works that were carried out at Mel Station. If you recall, Chair, a new lift was installed uh, because of a grant the uh, Mersey Travel received from the government. And so I suspect that part of the works is, is related to that and it's been done in a hurry. Um, I fully agree with the concerns that Councillor Wright has outlined. Um, it may only be a fence, but this is something that people have to live off opposite. So I would like to thank uh, Councillor Wright for her remarks and I look forward to hearing the other comments from other committee members this evening, Chair. Are there any further contributions from the floor? No. OK, um, for, for my point of uh, view, having um, seen this, and yes, I, I, I've driven past it prior to the lockdown, I assure you, so, so to that point. And uh, I think the member made the comment that beauty might be in the eye of the beholder, but I don't think it's very beautiful, <laughs> I have to say. Um, it is in the green belts. We do our green belt policies about visual immunity. Um, it's been tested against policy LA7, criteria for development of the urban fringe, which it uh, also is. Um, as part of those policies, uh, there's a requirement for uh, proposals for boundary treatments to be appropriate in terms of the character of the surrounding landscape and for prominent features within the landscape framework of the area to be retained and enhanced. And looking at the photographs and haven't seen it uh, as I've driven past this, uh, I, don't, I personally don't think that it meets uh, those two criteria within LA 
seven uh, of our policies. Um, the the committee's members have put a number of um, points. The committee's clearly divided on it. Um, and so I'll just alert the solicitor because she asked me to alert her. Um, I should like to put something before the committee, Celia, uh, that is not uh, a recommendation to approve test the patience of the committee on a refusal. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just to notify the um, members of the public, as members will be aware, members of the com committee must not predetermine any matter which comes to the committee for decision. To be, it, it is, however, entirely permissible for committee members to be predisposed towards a particular outcome with regards to an application, provided they don't make up their minds on how to vote before formally considering the details of the application and listening to the officer presentation and to the full debate on the application at committee. It's good practice for members to seek advice from the planning officer before the meeting on the wording of any potential motion a member may consider putting forward before the committee. Um, they must, the members must, however, um, consider all the, ma the material facts put before the committee prior to moving any motion. Um, and it is the role of the planning officer to provide professional, objective and comprehensive advice to the member on the wording of any potential motion. So with that in mind, if you are to, you know, you, you have that in mind, councillor, if you intend to move a motion um, other than the recommendation put forward by the officer. Thanks. Thanks for that advice. Yes, the, the report was quite clear which policies the um, uh, the uh, development was to be assessed against, uh, including policy LA7 and policy GB2. Um, both of those policies are subjective in nature. Um, obviously, I've listened to what members have said about the uh, uh, the the potential for fading improving the uh, uh, the defense and the uh, proposal for planting behind the fence but don't consider that either of those uh, condition personally don't consider that either of those will um, will allow it to meet in my view uh, the criteria for those for, with for those policies um, I have uh, with that in mind, discussed it with the plan officer. Um, can I put something in the chat box then for members to, to have a look at? Okay. So um, I'll move that the proposed fence by virtue of its length, height and appearance is visually intrusive and detrimental to the character of the surrounding area, contrary to policy LA7, criteria for development on the urban fringe, paragraphs two and three, and policy GB2, guidelines for development in the green belt. I'll move that. Beginning, Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Having listened to your proposal, I'm happy to second what you've, uh, what you've said this evening. Thanks for that. Uh, any other contributions from members now that they've seen a, propose, a proposal? I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, yes, uh, okay. Yeah, I've put it into my chat, but I haven't pressed the, uh, the thing. I've just got to wait for that thing to go now. Okay, there you go. Okay, that's now four members. Alan Bray was indicated. Let's just comment. Bring Alan in. Thank you, Chair. I'd, uh, I'd support your uh, your resolution. Um, my single comment is it's not so much offence as an offence. Uh, very good. <laughs> um, any other members? I'll just give a that, few more. Is that one for the press, is it? <laughs> yes. Thanks for that, Steve. Any, any further or shall I? Yeah, I'm just ask, asking if anybody has any further comments. Cathy, did you want to speak or was that just a comment? 
no. Okay, then I shall ask the solicitor, uh, who voted solicitor, to, uh, to to begin the vote on the uh, motion to refuse for the grounds that I've placed in the recent chat. Right. Thank you. And can I remind members to uh, repeat their names before they vote so that they can be seen as they vote? Thank you. Councillor Berry. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Berry here. And... Um, I support the motion put forward um, to reject this planning application. Uh, can I just clarify, Councillor Kelly, uh, Councillor uh, Berry? Sorry, are you voting for uh, or against or abstaining on the uh, recommendation or the motion to uh, refuse? I'm voting in favour of the recommendation to refuse. Thank you, Councillor Bain. Councillor Alan Brame, uh, I'm voting in favour of the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Davis? Voting in favour. Uh, Councillor Davis, I, I, can, I, can you turn your camera on so I can... It, is that on? No. It's on now. Can you see me? OK. Um, and I'm voting in favour. Right, thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Falks? Yes, uh, I've heard the full debate and I will be voting for the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Frost? Hi, yep, yeah, Councillor Samantha Frost. I've heard the full debate and I'll be voting for the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Hayes? Councillor Steve Hayes, I've heard the full debate and I'll be voting for the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Catherine Hodgson, I've heard the full debate and I'm in favour of the resolution to reject. Thank you. Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Mary Jordan, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting in favour of the resolution to reject. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Hi, Stu Kelly. Um, I've had the full debate. I'm voting in favour of my uh, recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. Thank you. I'm Councillor Brian Kenny. I've heard the full debate and I'm voting against the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. Hello, my name is Ian Lewis. I've heard the full debate and I am voting in favour of the Chair's resolution to reject the application. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, Paul Stewart. Hey, Councillor Paul Stewart, I uh, heard the full debate and I'm voting against the resolution. Thank you. Councillor Stewart Whittingham. Yes, Councillor Stewart Whittingham, yeah, I've heard the full debate, I'm abstaining. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Irene Williams. Uh, I've heard the full debate. And I'm, I'm voting for the resolution. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, members. The uh, motion to refuse has been passed by 11 votes to two with one abstention. That application has been refused. Okay, we now move to um, agenda item three, uh, which is Westwood, 112 to 114 Beckenhead Road, Mells. If you can ask the planning officers to introduce their report, please. Okay, uh, thank you through you, Chair. 
So planning permission is sought for the demolition of the existing dwellings and the redevelopment of the site with 27 apartments accommodated within two blocks. Uh, the site plan is on the screen uh, for you to see now. There will be 15 units in block A, which is um, this, uh, this block shaded in blue, which will be provided across three stories and will consist of three one-bedroom departments and 12 two-bedroom departments. In block B, which is the uh, peachy shaded uh, building, um, again, there will be 12 units three storeys that will consist of three one-bedroom departments and nine two-bedroom departments. Uh, the proposals have been amended since they were first submitted, removing the three townhouses that were originally proposed for the rear of the site, uh, which was down here in this bottom left-hand corner on the screen, and um, a substantial reduction in the scale and massing of Block A by some 36%. These changes have allowed for more amenity space to the rear of the development together with the provision of 27 parking spaces, which is in keeping with the Council's parking standards set out in supplementary planning document uh, number four. <coughs> the block, uh, both blocks are set in line with the dwellings fronting Birkenhead Road and reflect the heights of the properties on both sides of the development site. Uh, what you see in front of you now are the elevations for uh, block A and block B. And this is the, um, the, uh, the, the street scene along Birkenhead Road. At the top is the existing street scene and uh, at the bottom is uh, as proposed. Access to the site is via a single point in the middle of the site onto Birkenhead Road. There are no habitable room windows on the elevations facing number uh, numbers 110, that's this building here, and number 120, uh, Birkenhead Road, which is sorry, which is this building here, and the separation distances between the rear of the uh, of the apartment blocks and those dwellings to the rear of the site located on Bertram Drive are considerably in excess of the 23 meters required. So you can see the properties just at the bottom of the screen here, that front onto Bertram Drive. And so the separation distances from Block A, uh, the, the rear elevation of Block A, to the nearest point of the rear elevations of the properties on Bertram Drive is some 51 metres. And from Block B, um, again, to the rear elevation of those on Bertram Drive, that's 64 metres away. Um, the scheme will provide for 100% affordable housing units, which will be secured by a Section 106 legal agreement. The development seeks to maintain the scale of development in terms of scale and massing with the established street scene when viewing the proposals from their most exposed position, which is that facing onto Birkenhead Road. And this element of the proposal is considered to be acceptable. The proposals will not result in any adverse impact on the local highway network and the site is located in a sustainable location having access to public transport links. The proposals are considered to be an acceptable form of development within the primary residential area contributing towards an identified housing need and the provision of 100% affordable housing. The development would not harm the amenities of nearby properties or the overall character of the street scene or the wider locality, and they are recommended for approval subject to the Section 106 legal agreement. There is a qualifying petition of objection. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I understand the attempts were made to contact the petitioner, but, but no response was received. Uh, that's correct, Chair. Okay. Um, open to members then for debate and discussion. No, nobody in. Um, just as we were looking at those plans, just just for Thanks, the, Stuart. Happy to, uh, I didn't get it in time. I'm happy to uh, open a debate if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Okay, yeah. So again, Chair, um, just to reassure myself, I visited the, the site um and you know 
in reality, if if we uh, are genuinely serious about our aspirations for the local plan uh, and the direction of travel, talks about brownfield sites as and when they become available, maximising um, the output from them, and certainly um, possibly a degree of intensification. I think this is slight intensification. However, um, it's done in such a style, I believe, that it meets any reasonable planning criteria. Um, and if we are serious about protecting the green belt, and many of us say we are, uh, 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 that that if this application uh, starts and we start stacking up applications, if anyone was to move refusal, we start stacking up applications that are perfectly reasonable uh, in their content. And I know the developer has changed this in response to um, both residents and um, develop, uh, and officers' comments, but they have uh, seemingly seemingly uh, reacted and come up with an excellent development. If we start building up a track record um, of refusal of what can only be deemed as a very uh, pleasant application and affordable, um, when we come to examination of that local plan, it may be held against us that, well, you know, you're not serious about this local plan because it talks about maximising brownfield sites. However, you've refused X, Y, Z, and so on. So my view is that it, it, it makes a really valuable contribution. Um, it doesn't upset the street scene. It's affordable and it be a very attractive place for residents of Willow to live. So I've seen many positives in, in the, the scheme. Uh, so that they were my first impressions. And visiting the site, it is a, a very large site. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, Irene? Irene Williams? Okay, Chair. Um, yeah, I can't see anything wrong with this. Um, it's 100% affordable. The property would blend in well with the surrounding area. The separation distances are more than met. So I would um, be in favour of it. Thanks, Amy. Um Call on Sir Kathy, Kathy Hodgson. Can you put me in, please, to you next? Okay, George. Thank you, Chair. I'm gone. No, I, I, and as you know, as councillor for Heswell, we have a lot of um, applications like this where houses are knocked down and blocks of flats are built. And depending on where they are and how sympathetically they are developed in keeping with the street scene, I have to say that very often objections in the first instance, once these um, buildings are up, you don't really notice them. To, that, that, to some extent, they sort of fade into the street scene and look as if they'd already always been there. In this application, it's nice that the developer has altered it so that it's not cramped. Uh, there's, there's separation distances are met adequately, and there is a you know adequate foliage and greenery um, to make it look pleasant. And so it's it's an application that I would be very happy to support. Okay, thanks, for that, Kathy. Um, George, George is having a problem with this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say that, that having read the report fully uh, and understand exactly what it is, except for the the um, approval of the section one hundred and six agreements, I just think this is one of the the uh, one of the best I've seen for a long time. To be honest with you, uh, applications that have come through, uh, it's in a good position. Um, I think there's always a telltale on some of these that um, if there's if you don't get any op opposition towards it, then people have looked at it, weighed it up, and said it would be good for them in their area. And I have got no hesitation whatsoever in moving this. If you wish me to, I'll move approval of this scheme. Thanks, George. We'll take that as you moving, but I'll take um, Steve Hayes in now uh, to make a comment. Before we find a second. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I can only echo what other other members have said. Actually, I I, I think this is quite a nice application. The developer seems to have gone out of his way to sort of rectify any issues that may have been of con of concern. And I think it's a uh, you know affordable housing, and it's one I think we should support. Are you seconding it, Steve? 
Did you want to say? I'm happy to second. second. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have a proposal moved by George Davis and second by Steve Hayes. Um, also see, move that, Stuart. Okay, George. Uh, not seeing any members. Once we get a comment, uh, yes, I think I agree with what <laughs> what's been said, and I won't hold us up. Um, we'll move to the uh, voting. I should really have read out my little voting script. Okay, uh, voting will be for, against, or abstaining on the motion. The solicitor will call your name. Please turn on your camera and mic and say uh, who you are before voting. Members should only cast a vote if they've heard the planning officer's presentation and the debate in relation to this matter in full and have not had any technical difficulties during this item. In the event you have had problems here in the discussion, you should not vote and indicate not voting when called. So I'll hand over to the sisters to conduct the vote. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Um, Councillor Bruce Berry. Um, Councillor Bruce Barry have heard the full debate on voting in favour. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Bain. Uh, Councillor Alan Brame, um, I'm happy to support this uh, application. Councillor George Davis. Councillor George Davis, um, fully in support of this uh, recommendations. Thank you. Uh, can I just request that members say for, against, or abstain? Right. For, <laughs> sorry, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Fox. Councillor Steve Fox. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Steve Fox here. I've heard the debate uh, and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Frost. Hi, Councillor Sam Frost. I've heard the debate and I'll be voting for. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Councillor Steve Hayes, I've heard the full debate and I'll be voting for. Thank you. Councillor Hodson. Thank you, Chair. Kath Councillor Catherine Hodson, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for the application. Thank you. Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Chair. I've heard heard the full debate. Can, can you hear me? See me? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, that's good. Uh, and Councillor Mary Jordan, I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Um, Stuart Kelly, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. Thank you. Councillor Brian Kenny, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. Councillor Ian Lewis, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Paul Stewart, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Councillor Whittingham. Councillor Whittingham. Sorry, I was having technical difficulty. Uh, Stuart, Councillor Stuart Whiskham, I've heard the full debate. Uh, I'm voting in favour. Thank you. Thank Four. you. Councillor Williams. Councillor Irene Williams, I've heard the full debate and I'm voting for the application. Thank you. That's um, unanimous. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, members. That uh, application then has been approved uh, by 14 votes uh, to zero. Um, they're, the, they're the applications we have for this evening. So uh, um, thanks to those watching, and I'll declare the meeting closed. <laughs>